We start our adventure with Suzuki Aruma, a 14-year-old boy who seems to be a complete pushover. In fact, he is such a softie that his parents make him work dangerous jobs all the time. Our spineless boy is currently working at a tuna boat, and suddenly, just before frozen tunas fall over him, his life changes completely when he is transported into another realm. When he first arrives, he cannot understand the language of the demon, but the monster immediately puts a spell on him so he can understand and even write demon language. The explanation is simple. His parents sold him to a demon. Now this demon named Sullivan has a unique wish. He desires to have our protagonist as his grandson. The reason behind this peculiar wish is Sullivan's envy of his friends, who always brag about their own grandsons. To fulfill this wish, Sullivan takes Aruma to the netherworld and enrolls him in Babel's demon school. This school is not just any institution. It's a place where demons study, and being a human, Aruma is at risk of being eaten if his true identity is discovered. On his first day, our protagonist is taken aback when he learns that Sullivan is not just any demon, but the director of Babel's. The opening ceremony takes an unexpected turn when Aruma is pushed into the spotlight. Instead of the first-year representative, Asmodeus Alice delivering his speech, Sullivan insists that our protagonist take the stage. Unbeknownst to Iruma, the speech Sullivan provides him is a powerful spell designed to prevent any mishaps. As our protagonist recites the words, the entire student body is both terrified and impressed by the spell's potency. However, not everyone is pleased with our hero's sudden fame. Asmodeus Alice feels insulted and challenges Iruma to a duel. But our protagonist, having grown up in challenging circumstances due to his parents, has home an uncanny ability to evade danger. This skill is on full display during the duel, leading many to believe that Iruma is simply looking down on Asmodeus. The duel takes another twist when a female student is endangered, prompting our protagonist to act. Yet the effects of Sullivan's spell cause Iruma to perform a German suplex on Asmodeus, knocking him out and further boosting Iruma's reputation. Now the twist. Asmodeus, rather than holding a grudge, joyfully proclaims himself as Iruma's loyal servant. Sullivan, watching from the sidelines, is overjoyed, believing that his grandson has a promising future in the netherworld. At night, we observe Iruma reminiscing about his life in the human world. In a dream, he recalls moments with his mother who suddenly proposes selling him to the demon lord Sullivan. Waking up from this unsettling dream, our protagonist is greeted by Sullivan, who enthusiastically invites him for breakfast. During the meal, our hero's astonishing appetite is on full display as he consumes a vast amount of food. Although hesitant about attending the demon school, Iruma's reservations are swayed when Sullivan showers him with thoughtful gifts to celebrate his enrollment. Upon arriving at school, our protagonist is met by the ever-enthusiastic Asmodeus Alice, who informs him about the day's lesson, summoning familiars. The strength and nature of the summoned familiar will determine the student's rank and class placement. The atmosphere in the classroom is tense, and Aruma soon learns why. Their instructor, Niberius Caligo, is known for his strict and ruthless demeanor. He particularly takes an instant disliking to Iruma, possibly due to his connection with Sullivan. The summoning process is explained, students must use their blood on special parchments bearing Niberius seal. This seal ensures the authenticity of the summoning and prevents any form of cheating. As the summoning session progresses, Asmodeus successfully summons a fierce gorgon snake, impressing his peers. However, when it's our hero's turn, things take an unexpected twist. Due to his human nature and lack of demonic power, our protagonist inadvertently summons Nebere's Caligo himself, transforming the stern teacher into a small, adorable owl with bat wings and horns. This unforeseen event leaves the entire class in shock. Rumors quickly spread, suggesting that Iruma's power must be immense to bind someone as formidable as Nibarius as his familiar. Sullivan later clarifies that the summoning contract is unbreakable and will last for an entire year. The repercussions of this event are immediate. Nibarius becomes bedridden from the sheer shock, and our hero's rank remains undetermined. Some minutes later, Aruma encounters a lively student named Vala Clara. Despite her friendly demeanor, Asmodeus warns our protagonist to maintain his distance from her, labeling her as a weirdo that others tend to avoid. However, Iruma's kind-hearted nature compels him to interact with her, especially after she earnestly says please. During their interactions, Clara showcases her unique magical ability, her magical pockets. These pockets allow her to replicate any object she has seen, a skill that has been both a blessing and a curse for her. As Aruma soon discovers, many students have been exploiting Clara's generosity, manipulating her into producing free food and other items. This revelation is heart-wrenching as Clara admits to having grown accustomed to bribing others for their companionship, believing it's the only way she can make friends. However, our hero's genuine nature shines through when he refuses Clara's bribes, expressing his desire to be her friend without any conditions. This gesture deeply touches Clara, boosting her confidence. When the same students attempt to manipulate her again, Clara boldly stands up to them, even going as far as to hurl a drinks machine at them. The scene is both comedic and empowering, showcasing Clara's newfound assertiveness. Iruma, Having never had friends before is uncertain about the nature of his relationship with Asmodeus and Clara. 
A humorous incident at a snack stall further complicates matters. Clara's magical pockets land her in trouble with the stall owner, who accuses her of shoplifting. The situation escalates when Iberius Calego intervenes only to be tricked by Clara into being summoned by our protagonist, transforming him once again into the comical owl form. As the trio makes their escape, Aruma seeks clarity on their relationship. He is taken aback to learn that the concept of friends is foreign to demons. However, both Asmobius and Clara enthusiastically agree to be his friends, marking the beginning of a unique bond. Later, we see Sullivan and the faculty making the choice of placing Aruma, Clara, and Asmodeus in the Misfit class for problem children. However, the Misfit class, a class known for its notorious troublemakers, is revealed to be a strategic move by Sullivan. He believes that by surrounding Aruma with other Misfits, he wouldn't stand out as much. Nonetheless, Iruma's introduction to his new classmates is far from smooth. He finds himself navigating through a series of booby traps, a testament to the mischievous nature of the Misfit class. Among his classmates, Iruma meets the imposing Sabnak Sabro, a demon with aspirations of becoming the next demon king. Through Sabnak, our protagonist gains insight into the hierarchical structure of the demon world, learning about the ten demonic ranks. The coveted Yoth rank, or the tenth rank, is the pinnacle of this hierarchy and the demon king is always chosen from this elite group. The plot takes a comedic turn when Niberius Caligo, their advisor, introduces a task to determine their demonic ranks. The challenge involves a treacherous race through a valley with the added danger of a guardian beast. While most students opt for the safety of flight, our hero's lack of demon wings becomes a significant disadvantage. An impatient push from Niberius sends Aruma plummeting, only to be rescued by a flock of demonic crows. However, his relief is short-lived as he finds himself in the nest of the guardian beast's baby. A surprising discovery reveals that Aruma's human blood possesses healing properties for demons. This newfound ability not only saves the injured baby guardian but also earns Iruma an unexpected ally. As the baby guardian decides to assist our protagonist in the race elsewhere, Sabmak realizes the folly of his decision to confront the guardian beast directly. He wishes to prove himself superior to his pacifist older brother. Sabmak's ambition is further fueled when Iruma unexpectedly lands in front of him managing to pacify a guardian by showing that its child has been healed. This act leads Sabnak to believe that our protagonist possesses immense power, as he wasn't afraid of the Guardian. Asmodeus emerges victorious, securing the first position while Clara, riding on Asmodeus' shoulders, finishes second. Despite riding on the Guardian's back, Aruma and Sabnak finish last. After the race, Niberius introduces the Rank Owl, a creature responsible for providing the students with rank badges based on their performance. As the badges are distributed, Asmodeus receives the Dilette fourth rank, Clara gets Jaimel, 3rd rank, and Sabnak is awarded Bet, 2nd rank. However, instead of a badge, Aruma receives a mysterious golden ring. This ring isn't just any ordinary accessory. Sabnak recalls an ancient prophecy stating that the next demon king will possess unique abilities, the power to make other demons his servants, the ability to heal injuries with his blood being born a foreigner and wearing the legendary Solomon's ring, the appearance of the ring on our hero's finger and the subsequent manifestation of a black flame demon that begins draining power from his classmates only adds to the speculation. Niberius, sensing the immense power and threat from the ring, attempts to sever Aruma's arm to remove it. However, he is stopped in the nick of time by Sullivan. Sullivan reveals that the ring is the gluttonous feeder ring known for consuming magic power. He manages to pacify the ring by feeding it some of his own power. Despite the dramatic events, Aruma's rank remains undetermined and he is assigned the lowest rank Aleph by default. However, his actions including taming the Guardian and the incident with the ring only serve to increase his fame and reputation among his peers, which catches the attention of the student council. During a botany class, students are taught to harness their magic to cultivate demonic plants. Each student's plant reflects their personality and magical prowess. Sabmak Sabra, with his fierce determination, grows a wild flower that devours everything in its path. Asmodeus, with his elegance and fiery spirit, produces a flower with flaming petals. Clara, unpredictable as always, nurtures a bizarre flower that defies any logical explanation. Our protagonist, being a human and devoid of any magical abilities, humorously recites the spell while reminiscing about his home in Japan. Unexpectedly, a surge of magic emanates from the ring he wears, which was gifted to him by Sullivan. Sullivan contacts Aruma to inform him that the ring allows its wearer to utilize magic. However, Sullivan had overlooked setting a limit on its power output, causing it to sprout into a colossal cherry blossom tree, leading to the destruction of the greenhouse. Azazel Amari, the student council president, identifies the tree as a species native to the human world. This revelation raises her suspicions about our hero's true identity. Amari confides in our protagonist about a common misconception among demons. Most believe humans are mythical creatures. However, her family possesses a secret collection of sacred relics, which are essentially Japanese manga. She is particularly fond of the First Love Memories series. Due to her inability to read Japanese, she mistakenly interprets the manga as a manual containing human love spells. 
As Iruma attempts to clean up the mess caused by the cherry blossoms, she accidentally bumps into a Mary, causing her to fall. This incident mirrors a romantic scene from First Love Memories, leading a Mary to believe that Iruma is trying to cast a love spell on her using human magic. She jumps to the conclusion that Iruma must indeed be a human. Frozen and unsure of how to proceed, Iruma, ever the overthinker, believes Amari is upset with him. The atmosphere becomes even more tense when Amari accidentally drops a manga titled First Love Memories. To our hero's shock, he recognizes it as a manga he once illustrated back in the human world to earn some extra money. This revelation leads Amari to a startling realization. Iruma can read Japanese. Instead of confronting him about his human origins, she takes a different approach. She drags him to her office eager to have him read the manga out loud for her, perhaps wanting to experience the story through his voice. As our protagonist reads, the atmosphere gradually shifts from tense to intimate. By the end of the reading session, an embarrassed Amari, clearly moved by the story and Iruma's voice, saves her contact number in his phone. She hints at wanting him to read for her again in the future. This series of events leaves our protagonist in deep contemplation. He begins to compare his old life in the human world with his current life in the demon world. The differences are stark and he finds himself torn between the two worlds. His thoughts are interrupted by Sullivan's servant, Opera, who brings intriguing news. Haruma might have a chance to visit the human world again, but only if he ascends the ranks and becomes a high-ranking demon. However, before Iruma can fully process this information, he is summoned by Amari. This sudden summons doesn't go unnoticed. Asmodeus and Clara become suspicious of Amari's intentions. Their imaginations run wild. Asmodeus believes Aruma might be plotting to overthrow the student council, while Clara fears they're starting a new game without her. To keep an eye on Iruma, they purchase detection warding glasses, which allow them to tail him discreetly. As things develop, Iruma and Amari's interactions are influenced by the themes of first love memories. Amari, perhaps inspired by the manga, believes that spending time with our protagonist is akin to going on a date. Meanwhile, Iruma, after listening to Amari's ambitious plans for the future, has a moment of self-reflection. He realizes that his passive nature has always held him back from having ambitions of his own. Azaz -az is on high alert. He's trying to prevent the ever-energetic Clara from unintentionally sabotaging our hero's cover plans to take over the school. Iruma, meanwhile, is grappling with a personal dilemma. He's struggling to identify a dream or ambition for himself. Amari, the student council president, noticing his internal conflict, suggests that he could temporarily focus on elevating his demon rank as a goal. However, things take a humorous turn on Clara, feeling left out and threatened by Amari's closeness to Iruma, decides to take matters into her own hands. She mistakenly believes that Amari is trying to steal our protagonist away from her and their friend Asmodeus. Acting on advice from Sabnak, another demon student, Clara decides to try and win Iruma's heart using feminine wiles. There's just one problem. Clara doesn't possess any such wiles. Determined to change this, Clara enrolls in a seduction class designed for aspiring succubi. The class is taught by Raim, a succubus who can gauge an individual's level of sexiness. To Clara's dismay, Raim assesses her sexiness level at a mere 2%, deeming her almost as innocent as an infant. Undeterred, Clara embarks on a series of comedic attempts to increase her allure, all of which end in hilarious failures. Our protagonist, in his usual naive manner, misinterprets her actions as playful games. This leads to a series of misunderstandings, culminating in Clara receiving detention from the strict demon teacher. Feeling defeated and dejected, Clara is on the verge of giving up. However, a tender moment with her mother who kisses her forehead rejuvenates her spirits. The next day, she boldly attempts a kiss attack on Iruma. But Iruma, with his uncanny ability to dodge, evades her advance. Despite her series of misadventures, Clara's determination remains unshaken in her decision to make Iruma fall for her. To her surprise, our protagonist, in a moment of genuine innocence, admits that he does see her as a girl. This revelation boosts Clara's confidence immensely. And as they walk hand in hand, Iruma experiences an unfamiliar flutter in his heart. Observing from a distance, Rain notes with satisfaction that Clara's sexiness level has risen to 10%. Meanwhile, Aruma, inspired by the day's events and his interactions with his friends, resolves to focus on his new ambition, to elevate his demon rank from LF, first rank, to Bet, second rank. Aruma seeks the assistance of his friend Asmodeus to climb the demon ranks. Asmodeus, in his typical overzealous manner, dreams of Aruma reaching the 10th rank and ruling the school. However, our protagonist modestly expresses his desire to achieve the Bet rank. Asmodeus, intrigued by Aruma's ambition, informs him about the rank promotion exam, which is centered around Execution Cannonball, a perilous game resembling human dodgeball. Iruma, confident in his innate ability to evade danger, is taken aback when he discovers that other students can employ their demonic powers during the game. Seeking a competitive edge, Aruma approaches Sullivan for training. Sullivan introduces him to the concept of using his ring to harness magic for the exam. However, our protagonist, driven by his principles, decides to rely on his own abilities rather than resorting to borrowed magic. To level the playing field, Sullivan enhances our hero's hand strength and trusts the physical training to opera. 
Despite his relentless efforts, Iruma struggles with catching the ball due to his instinctual tendency to dodge. Yet, his determination never wavers. Opera observes Iruma's progress and joy during the training, assuring Sullivan of our hero's enjoyment. After rigorous training, our protagonist finally masters the skill of catching the ball, signaling his readiness for the exam. The atmosphere at Babel's Demon School is electric as the day of the much-anticipated exam arrives. Nibarius elucidates the rules. Students' ranks will be elevated based on the adversaries they vanquish. However, there's a catch. They must be part of the triumphant team. As the teams are announced, Aruma finds himself separated from his close friend, but in a display of camaraderie, Asmodeus pledges to aid Aruma, even if they are on opposing sides. The exam commences, and the arena is immediately thrown into pandemonium. Aruma's peers unleash their demonic abilities. Amidst the chaos, Clara, known for her unpredictable nature, inundates the court with a barrage of balls, making it challenging to identify the genuine one. Aruma, with his keen senses, manages to seize the real ball. But a realization dawns upon him. In all the training and preparation, he never mastered the art of throwing. As the game progresses, Sabnak grows increasingly vexed by Asmodeus' apparent daydreaming. In a swift move, he attempts to strike Asmodeus, only to be countered and knocked out. Asmodeus, seemingly lost in thought, continues his rampage, eliminating players with ease. The game narrows down to a face-off between him and our protagonist. A dilemma plagues Asmodeus. If he allows Aruma to win, he would be aiding his friend's ascent in rank. However, it would also mean negating all his efforts. After a brief internal struggle, he opts to unleash a powerful throw, putting all his might behind it. Just then, Amere, the esteemed student council president, makes her appearance, keen to witness the exam's climax. Aruma, mustering all of his courage, manages to catch Asmodeus' formidable throw, but the sheer force behind it propels him into a spin. Using this momentum, Aruma redirects the ball, which, to everyone's astonishment, strikes Asmodeus out. Nibarius, thoroughly impressed by our hero's ingenuity, elevates his rank to bet second. Post-exam, Amaria approaches Aruma, wanting him for his newfound ambition. The day concludes with our protagonist expressing his gratitude to Opera for the rigorous training. This leaves Sullivan feeling a tad emotional and overshadowed, realizing he hadn't contributed much to his recent success. The misfit class at Babel's Demon School is introduced to their new instructor, Boss Robin. With an air of authority, Bals emphasizes the significance of establishing a deep connection with one's familiar, a magical creature bound to a demon through a contract. Asmodeus proudly summons his gorgon snake, while Sabnak calls forth his majestic Kelby horse. Clara, ever the unpredictable one, brings forth her falful, a peculiar and rare familiar whose actions remain an enigma to many. Aruma, hesitant and unsure, initially resists the idea of summoning a familiar. However, Balsa's simple plea with the word please compels Aruma to act. To everyone's astonishment, Aruma inadvertently summons a livid Nibarius. Balsa, quick to intervene, reminds our protagonist of the importance of reining in and controlling one's familiar, citing rules penned by Nibarius himself. Taking it upon himself, Nibarius is determined to mold Aruma into the class's top summoner. This endeavor leads to a series of amusing and somewhat embarrassing trust-building games. During one of their interactions, Aruma offers a heartfelt apology to Nibarius, leading to a deeper conversation. Nibarius questions Aruma's decision not to summon him during the confrontation with the Valley Guardian. Our hero's response, rooted in compassion, reveals his intent to prevent harm to both Nibarius and the Guardian. This revelation deepens the bond between the two. Meanwhile, a skirmish erupts between Asmodeus and Sabmak. Nibarius, showcasing his prowess, swiftly defeats their familiars. He then addresses the class, emphasizing the raw power and volatile nature of familiars. He stresses the delicate balance summoners must maintain, a blend of trust and fear, a sentiment embodied by our protagonist. The lesson concludes with Nibarius compelling Balls to reevaluate his pedagogical approach. The plot takes another turn as Aruma discovers the concept of battlers. These are akin to school clubs, where students with shared interests band together to assist each other in elevating their ranks. Intrigued and motivated to find a new purpose, our protagonist contemplates joining a battler. Asmodeus, ever the protective friend, preps Aruma for the rookie hunt. This event, notorious for its intensity, sees senior battlers in a frenzied rush to recruit first-year students. Asmodeus, with his formidable reputation, becomes the prime target for recruitment by most seniors. The intensity of the hunt escalates to such a degree that the safety of the first-year students is compromised, putting them in real physical danger. Amari, along with the student council, takes on the responsibility of overseeing the unfolding chaos. It's during this tumultuous event that Iruma discovers Amari's significant role as the student council president, a revelation that surprises him. In a twist of events, Amari extends an invitation to Iruma, offering him a position in the council's elite battler team. Nibarius, seizing the moment, announces a three-day trial period. 
This period allows students the freedom to experiment and try out various battlers before making the final commitment. Clara, with her quirky and enthusiastic nature, repeatedly expresses her fascination with Raim's succubus battler. Our protagonist, on the other hand, finds himself in a dilemma. His newfound popularity means that he's swamped with invitations from every battler. However, a sudden activation of his ring disrupts his decision-making process. The ring, seemingly with a mind of its own, propels him through the air only to drop him in the presence of Amy Kirio. Kirio, the chief recruiter for the magical apparatus battler, possesses a necklace crafted from the same mysterious metal as Iruma's ring. As things move along, Aruma embarks on a journey to explore the various battlers. Most of these battlers present dangers and challenges, making them unsuitable choices for Aruma. In a bid to assist Aruma, Sullivan modifies his ring, granting him the ability to select the intensity of magic he wishes to harness. The options range from Devil, Demon, and Ifrit, with an emergency mode named Pandarula. After a rigorous testing phase of the Execution Cannonball Battler, Aruma receives a timely reminder from Amere via text. She emphasizes the importance of visiting the Council Battler before the trial period concludes. However, before our protagonist can act on this, he finds himself caught in a massive explosion, a result of one of Kirio's magical apparatus malfunctions. We start watching the Council members. They are taken aback by Amere's sudden and intense passion for Battler recruitment. Amidst the chaos caused by Kirio's explosion, Iruma sends a text to Amere informing her of his inability to visit the Council. Amere, however, misinterprets this message, believing that Iruma is intimidated by her position as the Council President. Kirio, a pivotal character at this time, sheds light on his unique predicament. He possesses the knowledge and skill to research and craft magical items. However, a significant drawback hinders his potential, his inherently weak magical power. This limitation prevents him from utilizing the very items he creates. Driven by a noble cause, Kirio aspires to bridge the power disparity between demons. He envisions a world where weaker demons can confidently challenge and stand up against their more powerful counterparts, who often oppress them. Moved by Kirio's vision and determination, our protagonist decides to align himself with Kirio's battler. This decision is not made in isolation as both Clara and Asmodeus choose to accompany him. The plot takes a heartwarming turn when Aruma, contrary to Amari's fears, pays a visit to the student council. Amari's joy, however, is short-lived. Her happiness turns to disappointment when Iruma reveals his allegiance to another battler. As the trial period concludes, the atmosphere at the school becomes electric, gearing up for the grand battler party. This event serves as a platform for battlers to introduce their new recruits and also to familiarize themselves with their parents. Parallelly, a significant subplot unravels. Sullivan is summoned to the Thirteen's Dinner, a prestigious gathering of the Netherworld's Thirteen Most Formidable Demons. The crux of their discussion revolves around the growing instability in the Netherworld primarily due to the absence of a reigning demon king. The consensus leans towards the elevation of either Sullivan, Levi, or Belial to the coveted throne. While both Levi and Belial endorse Sullivan as the ideal candidate, Sullivan declines the offer. His reason is heartfelt. Ascending to the throne would drastically reduce his moments with Aruma. Later, we observe a shocking revelation. Henry, one of the esteemed 13 and also Amari's father, discovers incriminating evidence against Sullivan. This evidence points to Sullivan's unauthorized visits to the human world leading to his inevitable arrest. Sometime later, we observe Sullivan under intense scrutiny by the demon border control. Meanwhile, the first-year students grapple with anxiety, dreading the impending visit of their parents to the school. In Sullivan's absence, leadership responsibilities fall upon Nebarius, who was appointed as the interim school director. The school staff, bewildered by the recent turn of events, speculates about the possible reasons behind Sullivan's arrest. Kirio, ever the fountain of information, unveils a significant aspect of the Battler Party. He discloses that all battlers are expected to present their achievements, competing for coveted prizes and potentially elevating their rank. However, the magical apparatus battler, constrained by a meager budget, usually finds itself at a disadvantage. This bleak scenario takes a hopeful turn when Iruma, inspired by a brilliant idea, proposes the creation of fireworks. Given the need for a dark environment to test the fireworks, Kirio suggests an overnight stay at the school. Kirio's unique ability to conjure magical barriers comes to light. This protective shield, as Kirio reveals, is the sole reason he has survived countless explosions in his experiments. In their pursuit of crafting the perfect firework, our protagonist approaches Amari with a request to borrow one of her manga. This would provide Kirio with a visual reference for their creation. Initially hesitant, Amari's love for fireworks eventually sways her decision in their favor. The duo's hard work culminates in the successful creation of dazzling fireworks. The joy of their achievement is followed by a playful pill of fight, showcasing Iruma's exceptional dodging skills and Kirio's barrier magic. However, the plot takes a dark twist towards the end. Kirio receives a communication from a formidable demon named Baal, known for his mastery over lightning magic. The revelation that Baal is the mastermind behind Sullivan's arrests sends shockwaves. More alarmingly, it is unveiled that Baal and Kirio have been conspiring together. 
to engineer a machine with the capability to obliterate the school. Battler Party is slated to span three days. The stakes are high, with the winning Battler members being promised an elevation in rank. The cherry on top is the additional incentive for the Battler President, who stands to gain a hopping two-rank increase upon securing first place. As the plot progresses, the spotlight shifts to Kirio, who is deeply engrossed in perfecting his machine. Through a series of flashbacks, it becomes evident that the completion of this intricate device was made possible only due to our hero's invaluable assistance. However, a shadow looms over this achievement. Kirio's enigmatic demon ally harbors a malevolent intent to deploy the machine as a weapon, aiming to annihilate as many students as possible. In a twist of fate, Kirio's clandestine workshop is inadvertently discovered by Aruma, drawn by the magnetic pull of his ring, which seems to resonate with Kirio's necklace. Aruma stumbles upon the hidden lair. Seizing the moment, Kirio unveils the secrets of his workshop to our protagonist. He reveals its strategic location on the school's rooftop, concealed behind one-way, soundproof glass. The plot thickens as Kirio hints at the integral role of the school bell in his grand scheme. This bell he mentions will herald the commencement of the Battler Party. Despite being privy to these revelations, Aruma remains oblivious to the true depth of Kirio's machinations. With unwavering optimism, Aruma encourages Kirio to vie for the top prize at the Battler Party using their fireworks. He passionately argues that strength isn't the sole determinant of victory. This heartfelt plea resonates with Kirio, who finds solace in the realization that he and Iruma share striking similarities in their outlook. Sometime later, it seems that the party is ready to begin. As the festivities kick off, Kirio's face is illuminated with a blend of anticipation and delight. This event, celebrated the night before the main competitions, is a spectacle of lights and excitement. As the darkness is essential for the fireworks display, Iruma and his friends decide it's the perfect time to assess their competition. While scouting, our protagonist unexpectedly becomes a participant in a challenge set by the Yakisoba Battler. He astonishingly devours their renowned oversized serving of Yakisoba, unintentionally knocking them out of the competition due to a lack of ingredients. His classmates, always eager to share information, warn Aruma about the formidable competitors he will face. These include the new Magic Battler, who has the audacious plan to conjure water from a mere stone, and the Game Battler, boasting a virtual sorcery hat that promises participants a dive into virtual reality adventures. The underwater circus promises a mesmerizing underwater performance, while the magic beast battles are sure to be a test of strength and strategy. Asmodeus, ever the strategist, reveals their plan to set off their main firework precisely when the school bell rings, signaling the commencement of the competition. However, chaos ensues when Clara, in her typical clumsy fashion, accidentally ignites the fuse. To their horror, not only does the firework misfire, but they also discover that their most magnificent firework has vanished. The plot thickens as Kirio is revealed to be the culprit, taking the stolen firework to his secret workshop. Concurrently, a significant revelation comes to light. Amari's father comes into possession of evidence that suggests Sullivan kidnapped Aruma. This evidence is provided by none other than Bull. As the sun dips below the horizon, casting the school in twilight, Kirio takes a drastic step. He shatters his necklace, which results in the entire school being enveloped by multiple barriers. These barriers restrict movement, causing panic and confusion among the students. Iruma finds himself isolated, separated from both Asmodeus and Clara by one such barrier. With the school in chaos, Kirio initiates his ominous plan. The sudden appearance of barriers throughout the demon school sends shockwaves among the students and faculty. Iruma, having had previous encounters with Kirio, recognizes the barriers as Kirio's handiwork. Nabarius, ever the analytical demon, discovers that these barriers possess a unique self-repairing property. This revelation leads him to deduce that only a demon of the Tet rank, the ninth rank, could cast such barriers. Furthermore, only a Yod, the tenth rank demon like Sullivan, could potentially destroy them. This realization implies that Sullivan's arrest was premeditated. He then instructs another teacher to inform the students that these barriers are part of a surprise maze event orchestrated by the new magic and game battlers. As Nibirius delves deeper into his research, he compiles a list of demons with the capability to create barriers. However, when a majority of the students effortlessly reach the courtyard, Nibirius grows concerned, suspecting they might have been manipulated into gathering there. Meanwhile, Kirio, with mischief in his eyes, loads the stolen firework into his ominous school destroyer machine. But as he prepares for his grand plan, he's taken aback to realize that our protagonist is heading straight to his lab. This is surprising because Kirio believed that by destroying his necklace, he had ensured Aruma would be lost. However, a flashback reveals the astute Asmodeus had deduced Kirio's long-term plan. Using a map of the school and a magical apparatus copied by Clara, Asmodeus guides Aruma through the maze of barriers. Nibirius, connecting the dots, identifies Kirio as the prime suspect and orders the school's teachers to apprehend him. But as the plot unfolds, a section of the school crumbles, leading to a heart-stopping moment where Amari heroically saves his student from certain death. 
The climax of this moment sees Aruma, determined and resolute, finally reaching Kirio's lab, setting the stage for a confrontation. The tension escalates as Iruma confronts Kirio in his workshop. Kirio, with a sinister glint in his eyes, unveils his malevolent plan to use the stolen firework to obliterate the entire demon school. He delves into his past, revealing the legacy of the Amy family, renowned for their formidable barriers and magical prowess. However, Kirio's birth with weak magic led to his exile to the Garden of Delinquents, a place for problematic children. Despite the adversities and bullying he faced, Kirio found solace in a friend. A turning point in his life occurred when Bull snatched her precious earring and discarded it into a river. Kirio's desperate attempt to retrieve it using a barrier ended in failure, causing immense grief to his friend. This incident awakened a dark realization within Kirio. He derived perverse pleasure from witnessing others' despair. Bull, a demon nostalgic for the malevolent past of their society, aligns with Kirio's vision. Together, they conspire to destroy Babels, symbolizing the softened nature of the current demon society. Kirio's ultimate goal is to savor Aruma's anguish upon witnessing the demise of his dear friends Clara and Asmodeus. However, Kirio's expectations are shattered when Aruma displays an unexpected calmness. Effortlessly removing the firework, our protagonist recounts his challenging childhood, which has rendered him almost immune to despair. This revelation stuns Kirio, making him realize the stark contrast between their personalities. In a climactic moment, Aruma activates his ring's Ifrit mode, attempting to launch the firework into the sky. But the barrier obstructs its path. With mere seconds to avert a catastrophe, Aruma breaks a solemn promise made to Sullivan. He unleashes the ring's formidable Pandarula mode, shattering the barrier and allowing the firework to explode harmlessly in the sky. This spectacle mesmerizes the students below. Exhausted from the ordeal, our protagonist loses consciousness. In a surprising twist, Kirio prevents Aruma from plummeting off the roof. Despite the rage bubbling within him over his foiled plan, Kirio concedes defeat, acknowledging our hero's superior demonic nature. Now we get a revelation. As Aruma and Kirio were engrossed in their intense conversation, Boss Robin, with impeccable precision, employed his archery magic to dispatch a warning note to Sullivan. This alert prompts Sullivan to break free from his confinement and witness Aruma's audacious act of using the Pandarula mode to obliterate the barrier. Sullivan's timely intervention saves the school from the potential catastrophe of falling to brace. The school's faculty swiftly apprehends Kirio. Despite his capture, Kirio leaves our protagonist with a foreboding message about other demons who yearn for a malevolent society. The demon border control takes Kirio into custody for further interrogation. In a lighter moment, Sullivan showcases to Aruma the immense popularity of his firework display among the students. However, a merry feeling left out reprimands Aruma for not watching the fireworks alongside her. In a gesture of camaraderie, Aruma shares the credit for the fireworks success with Asmodeus, Clara, and even Kirio. The festivities of the battler party commence, with students casting their votes for their favorite battlers. The atmosphere becomes even more jubilant as parents arrive to partake in the celebrations. Iruma, engrossed in preparing the remaining fireworks, encounters Clara's vibrant family. He meets four of her five siblings and her equally eccentric mother. Asmodeus finds himself ensnared by his doting mother, Amaryllis, the demon lord of seduction. Her overwhelming affection for Asmodeus provides comic relief. The arrival of Sullivan and Opera to the festival stirs chaos, with their larger-than-life presence captivating everyone. As dusk envelops the school, the sky is illuminated by a spectacular fireworks display. Overwhelmed by emotions, our protagonist proclaims his newfound demon family as his pride and joy. He insists on capturing this memorable moment with a photograph alongside Sullivan and Opera. Now it seems that everyone is excited about the announcement of the winner of the Battler Party. Could our hero be worth a prize? The closing spectacular, a grand event at Babel's Demon School, kicks off with the distribution of coveted prizes. The succubus battler is awarded an upgraded club room, a testament to their prowess. The new magic battler receives a year's supply of the rare black holy water. The most anticipated prize, the rank increase, is bestowed upon the broadcast battler, marking their exceptional performance. In an unexpected twist, Nibarius, the strict yet fair teacher, announces the introduction of an additional award. This surprise award promises a rank increase for one member of the winning battler. The magical apparatus battler, despite their earlier disqualification due to Kirio's machinations, emerges victorious. Iruma, to his astonishment, is promoted to Gaimol, the third rank. This sudden elevation leaves our protagonist in a dilemma, as he grapples with the fear of drawing too much attention to himself instead of blending in. The plot takes a dramatic turn when Amari's enigmatic father, Henry, expresses his curiosity about Iruma. A seemingly casual summon by Amari for Aruma to read manga takes a tense turn when Henry makes his presence felt. Henry's skepticism about Sullivan's fondness for Aruma leads to a confrontation. Henry recounts a past encounter with a human, whom he had legally sent back to the human realm. Just as he is about to question our hero's desire to return home, Amari intervenes. 
She passionately lists Aruma's achievements, asserting his credentials as an exemplary demon. In a comedic twist, Henry's probing about Amari's relationship with our protagonist leads to an awkward confession, rendering Henry speechless. Asmodeus and Clara, sensing the undercurrents of the recent events, assure Iruma of their unwavering support. They express their willingness to wait for our protagonist to confide in them about his encounter with Kirio. At the end, his firm resolution to stay in the demon world and intensify his efforts to conceal his human identity. The newspaper is abuzz with the news of Aruma's recent rank increase, overshadowing even the popular Demdol Kuromu. Asmodeus elucidates the significance of Demdols in the demon society. Teenage demons during their rebellious phase often undergo an evil cycle where they exhibit destructive behavior. Demdols, with their charm and entertainment value, play a pivotal role in channeling these destructive impulses into healthy excitement, preventing chaos. Kuromu, the Demdol sensation, is later unveiled to be none other than Crocel Karoli, a reserved student from the Misfit class. Contrary to her vibrant onstage persona, Crocel is deeply embarrassed about her idol identity. Despite her siblings excelling academically, Crocel discovered the power of her cuteness. Many demons treated her with kindness solely because of her adorable appearance. This realization spurred her to adopt the Kuromu persona, aiming to surpass her siblings and even achieve a rank higher than her mother. However, since Aruma's arrival at the demon school, he has consistently dominated the headlines, much to Crocel's chagrin. Her growing envy reaches its peak during one of her concerts when she spots our protagonist among the audience. To add to the coincidence, Aruma wins a special ticket granting him a personal meeting with Kuromu. As they meet, a flustered Crocel grapples with maintaining her secret identity. But to her surprise, Aruma already recognized her, not because of her fame but due to her unique hands. Crocel's glasses, which contain a ward to prevent identity detection, lead her to mistakenly believe that our protagonist must be a diehard fan to notice such minute details. However, Aruma confesses his envy towards her ability to seamlessly switch between her identities as he often inadvertently stands out. The revelation that Iruma achieves popularity without even trying further intensifies Crocel's frustration. Overwhelmed by her emotions and the excessive use of her ice magic, she collapses, succumbing to a fever. And her manager, Mal, contemplates canceling the much-anticipated concert. The only remedy to bring Crocel back to her senses requires the presence of a family member. However, none seem to be available to reach in time. Amidst this chaos, Amari, the student council president, is spotted in the audience having received a ticket from her father, who is part of the security detail for the event. As Crocel drifts into a restless slumber, she is haunted by nightmares of letting her family down and the weight of their expectations. To everyone's astonishment, the show takes an unexpected turn when Aruma, known for his aversion to the limelight, steps onto the stage. Dressed convincingly as a female, he delivers a captivating opening act, accompanied by Clara and Asmodeus, both disguised as Demdols. Their performance serves as a diversion, buying precious time for Crocel to recover. A Marion, with her sharp observation, can't shake off the uncanny resemblance between the Demdol on stage and Aruma. However, she dismisses the thought, finding it too implausible. Upon awakening, Crocel is met with the revelation of our hero's selfless act. Recognizing the lengths to which our protagonist went, especially given his discomfort with attention, she gains a newfound respect for him. Grateful yet mischievous, she expresses her thanks but insists that Iruma continues performing for the entirety of the concert. Post-concert, Mal shares heartwarming news with Crocel. Contrary to her belief, her entire family had rushed to her aid while she was unconscious, filling her with immense joy. In a private conversation with Aruma, Mal divulges a family secret. Crossel's family adores her deeply and never misses a concert on TV. Their absence in person is due to a peculiar trait. They faint from excessive excitement. Back in the school corridors, Crossel playfully warns Aruma against revealing her identity, hinting at dire consequences. Yet, in the same breath, she inquires if they can remain friends, albeit begrudgingly acknowledging the attention female our protagonist garnered in the press. The day begins with Aruma's hopeful prediction of an ordinary day ahead. He shares a delightful breakfast with his guardian, Sullivan, and later witnesses the playful race between Asmodeus and Clara as they dash towards school. The day progresses with routine activities, attending homeroom with the stern Nibirius and participating in regular lessons. Post-school, Aruma engages in his newfound hobby of introducing manga to Amari. As they delve into a story centered around secrets, Amari's thoughts drift to the mysterious female Demdol who bore an uncanny resemblance to our protagonist. She hesitantly inquires if anything has been troubling Iruma, to which he responds in the negative. However, a fleeting touch of their hands sends Amari's heart racing, leaving her flustered. Returning home, Aruma indulges in a relaxing bath followed by a hearty dinner with Sullivan. As he prepares to retire for the night, a profound realization dawns upon him. He is seamlessly integrated into the demon society, and the absence of any discomfort or resistance perturbs him. This introspection leads him to contemplate the tempting offer made by Henry, the chance to erase his memories and return to the human world. Aruma's uncharacteristic aloofness doesn't go unnoticed. 
Asmodeus and Clara, concerned about their friend's well-being, hatch a plan to lift his spirits through food. Sneaking into the school kitchen, their culinary venture takes a competitive turn. While Clara, inspired by her mother's words, focuses on infusing love into her eccentric dish, Asmodeus, battling his ichthyophobia, opts for a refined fish dish. The following morning presents a delightful surprise for Iruma. The two distinct dishes, when combined, create a harmonious and delectable flavor. Asmodeus and Clara, after a taste test, concede to a draw and reconcile their differences. However, their camaraderie is short-lived as they soon find themselves embroiled in another playful dispute. And so we end our first season with our hero's firm decision. Embracing the bonds he has forged and the experiences he has gained, he chooses to remain in the netherworld. Now let's start with Season 2. Aruma just returned to his familiar routine at the Demon School. We watch as he wakes up in his now-beloved mansion with his beloved grandpa. Outside, his now trusty friends are already waiting for him. They all merrily go to school and afterward, they take a class where our hero uses the power of his ring to make a transformation spell, changing the color of frog to black. Sometime later, Aruma heads towards the cafeteria for his lunch. A peculiar and familiar presence emerges from his gluttonous feeder ring. This time, however, it's not just the same apparition. Now it can talk. To the astonishment of both Aruma and the newly vocal creature, they discover that this enigmatic entity is the embodiment of the gluttonous feeder ring itself. Intriguingly, the creature adopts the name Alacrid or Ailey, and assumes a proper form with the help of a transformation spell, turning into a small, slim, one-eyed figure dressed in a dapper suit. With a hint of sternness, Alacrid chides our protagonist for his underutilized magical abilities, setting the stage for an unconventional mentor-student dynamic. Encouraging Aruma to explore his transformative powers further, Alacrid guides him through a series of experiments culminating in Aruma's astonishing transformation into his own distinctive Arumi outfit. This metamorphosis, however, coincides with an unexpected appearance by the school's refined and astute Ameri Azazo. Ameri stumbles upon our protagonist who is now sporting his transformed appearance. Completely caught off guard and flustered by Aruma's unexpected attire, Ameri reacts with confusion before swiftly making her exit. Aruma is left struggling to explain himself, but Alacrid insists on maintaining his anonymity until they can confirm the existence of other cases similar to their own. Undeterred by the comedic misunderstanding with Ameri, our protagonist becomes consumed by a newfound determination to uncover the truth behind Alacrid's existence. Iruma embarks on an intellectual quest. Seeking answers, he turns to his guardian and mentor, only to be met with dismissal and skepticism. Driven by a burning curiosity, Aruma immerses himself in research, meticulously analyzing the moments when Alacrid exhibited consciousness in the past. Through his dedicated efforts, our protagonist makes a remarkable revelation. The evolution of Alacrid's form corresponds with Aruma's progression through the ranks of the demon world. This pivotal insight leads our protagonist to make a solemn declaration, a resolution to ascend the ranks of the demon world hierarchy, even if it means drawing more attention to himself. As Aruma embarks on his ambitious journey to unravel the enigma of Alacrid's existence, he notices that he still needs to clarify the misunderstanding with Ameri. On another day, we see Ameri, who has unsettling nightmares about Aruma cross-dressing. These vivid dreams leave her in a mix of embarrassment and confusion. However, the plot thickens as Crosso, a popular idol demon, devises a cunning plan to handle her enthusiastic fans' curiosity about the identity behind her concert's hidden idol. Crosso decides to make our protagonist wear her dress for a photograph, leading to an unexpected struggle. Amid the struggle, a Mary enters the scene and witnesses an awkward moment with our protagonist atop Crosso, immediately intervenes and drags Aruma away from the situation. This gives her a chance to confront Aruma about the magical apparatus battler, which was closed down after the incident involving Kirio. Ameri proposes an intriguing challenge to our protagonists Clara and Asmodeus. In exchange for reopening the magical apparatus battler, each of them must obtain letters of recommendation from three battler presidents. Clara takes a temporary detour into the gaming battler. Asmodeus explores the new magic battler, and much to Aruma's dismay, he finds himself thrust into the student council under Ameri's leadership. As our protagonist embarks on his student council journey, he discovers Ameri's impressive capabilities firsthand. He's particularly taken aback by Ameri's firm determination to prevent Sullivan from spoiling him excessively. Their interactions deepen Aruma's admiration for Ameri's strengths and the responsibility she handles with grace. A pivotal moment occurs during a seemingly simple reading session of First Love Memories. As they share this innocent moment, Ameri's teacup unexpectedly shatters, casting a shadow of ominous foreboding over the scene. Despite this, Iruma's growth within the student council becomes evident as he takes on tasks and responsibilities that leave a positive impression on his fellow council members. Ameri faces her own internal conflict as she contemplates whether to induct our protagonist as an official member of the student council. However, the episode takes a darker turn when Ameri is mysteriously lured away by an unknown hooded figure who later d her. Her absence raises alarms within the student council, prompting a search for her whereabouts. 
When they eventually find her, Amari's behavior becomes unsettling and strange, leaving her friends deeply concerned for her well-being. A New Day We watch as the student council is struck by a surprising revelation. Amari has fallen victim to a spell that, while preserving her previous memories, has transformed her into a more delicate, ladylike persona. To reverse this magical alteration, it is believed that she needs to maintain her customary routine. However, the task at hand proves to be far more challenging than anticipated. The student council members grapple with their newfound responsibilities, attempting to fill the void left by Amari's inability to manage her usual workload. Additionally, they are faced with the difficulty of reconciling their current duties with the whimsical appearance Amari now presents. The situation takes an unexpected turn when Ronov Romir, the flamboyant president of the disciplinary battler, makes a grand entrance. The council suspects Rano of orchestrating Amari's transformation and subsequent predicament. In a playful yet enigmatic manner, Rano announces his intentions to seize control of the student council under the premise that Amari is no longer fit to lead. He remains coy when questioned about his involvement in the spell. To settle matters, he proposes a high-stakes dissolution election that empowers the student body to decide the future of the council. The terms are clear. The candidate who receives the fewest votes will be dissolved. The tension escalates as Rono's audacious challenge takes center stage. An intriguing encounter unfolds as Aruma steps forward to protect Amari from Rono's advances, demonstrating his growing courage and determination. A gesture of defiance against Rono's advances earns our protagonist praise from his fellow council members. The dynamics among the council members are highlighted as their respect for Aruma's actions becomes evident. The narrative advances to the following day and Rano begins his strategic campaign using his bloodline ability, Charisma. His approach generates a mixed response among the student body until he promises a more lenient and enjoyable council experience compared to the current regime. Meanwhile, Amari grapples with the challenges of maintaining her support base in her altered state. As the stakes rise, our protagonist realizes the need for additional assistance. He reaches out to Clara and Asmodeus for support in the midst of the mounting pressure. Just as Amari seeks Aruma's guidance, Alacrid re-enters the scene. He shares a pivotal piece of information, revealing that the spell's reversal is within reach and requires a specific trigger to enact the complete transformation. In a heartwarming and visually striking moment, Amari approaches Aruma dressed in her original student council attire. Amari's hopes of reverting to her former self by donning her old outfit are dashed, prompting her to contemplate a drastic decision. Leaving the student council behind to embrace a tranquil high school life alongside our protagonist. However, his steadfast refusal and heartfelt praise for her hardworking nature it meant a spark of realization within Amari. The dissolution election unfolds as Ronov takes the stage, enticing the student body with his promise of transforming the school into a realm of pure delight. Amari's memory of her aspirations for Babel's Academy to flourish under her leadership resurfaces, invoking a surge of passion. In a captivating moment, she delivers an impassioned speech urging her fellow students to prioritize their own ambitions over Rono's enticing promises. Amid the crowd, Amari's gaze locks onto Iruma, and in a moment of self-discovery, she realizes her profound affection for him, triggering her return to her original self. The mystery surrounding Amari's enchantment is further explored as Rono vehemently denies any involvement in her predicament. The tables turn when Clara and Asmodeus unveil a true culprit, Elagath Shinol, responsible for concocting the ladder-like perfume that induced Amari's transformation. Elidath's perverse intentions to fulfill his fantasies are unveiled, underscoring the gravity of his actions. With Elidath's schemes exposed, the story takes an unexpected twist as Amari extends an invitation to Ranov, welcoming him to join the student council. Additionally, she extends the same invitation to our protagonist, reflecting her desire to forge a connection. Iruma's response, however, is marked by his aspiration to reinstate the magical apparatus battler, while also expressing his wish to see Amari during their next reading of First Love Memories. The enigmatic Alacrid reappears, offering insight into the complex triggers behind the spell that entrapped Amari. He suggests that Amari's subconscious longing for Iruma's acknowledgement of her cuteness played a significant role in the process. Amari's internal conflict, initially stemming from her uncertainty around her protagonist, takes a transformative turn as she grapples with her emotions. Amari wrestles with the dilemma of returning to normalcy while remaining genuine around Iruma. Eventually, she musters the courage to pursue her true feelings, ultimately deciding to claim our protagonist as her own. Some time later, Sullivan announces his plans to host a party and urges Aruma to invite his friends. He, being the kind and humble character that he is, feels a mixture of excitement and nervousness about the upcoming event. As the preparations for the party get underway, our protagonist becomes increasingly fixated on cleaning every nook and cranny of his home. However, his friend Alacrid playfully teases him about inviting Clara over as his first female guest. Aruma's anxiety about making a good impression deepens and he throws himself even more passionately into his cleaning spree. Sullivan, recognizing Aruma's concerns, decides to alleviate his worries in his own peculiar way. He proposes a game called Dark Parade to be played in the basement, which turns out to be the demon version of a test of courage. 
This prompts our protagonist to venture into the eerie basement with his friends, where they are met with dim lighting and spine-tingling atmosphere, and Sullivan has a sneaky plan to make himself appear heroic in front of Aruma's friends. However, his well-intentioned plan takes an unexpected twist when Asmodeus swiftly defeats the fabricated monster before Sullivan can even make a move. Sullivan's pride takes a hit. With the party's centerpiece challenge seemingly foiled, Opera, a skilled and cunning demon, devises an ingenious solution to salvage the situation. Utilizing a 3D projector, Opera conjures an illusion of a fearsome dragon, aiming to let Sullivan triumph over this apparent threat. The elaborate charade unfolds and Sullivan valiantly defeats the illusory dragon, to the astonishment and applause of the onlookers. To everyone's delight, a chest materializes, revealing a delectable cake crafted by Opera as the coveted reward for the triumphant participant. However, Sullivan's happiness is short-lived as Opera receives more accolades for the cake's delectable flavor than Sullivan does for his daring dragon-slaying feat. Despite the minor setback, Sullivan's spirits are buoyed when our protagonist, with a heart full of gratitude, he approaches Sullivan to express his heartfelt thanks for allowing his friends to visit and for orchestrating the unforgettable evening. Little does our protagonist know, an unexpected twist awaits him. Alucard, observing our hero's longing to adapt seamlessly to demon life, decides to lend a clandestine hand. Employing his magical abilities, Alucard subtly tweaks Aruma's personality to mimic that of the teenage demon undergoing their first evil cycle, making him come across as rude, ungrateful, and, well, downright evil. The next morning, Sullivan awakens to an alarming sight. His cherished Aruma has undergone a shocking transformation into a being that seems unrecognizable. On a new day, we watch as our protagonist exhibits a remarkably different personality, leading his classmates to believe he's caught in the midst of his evil cycle. This twist in Aruma's demeanor leads to assumptions and misconceptions among his peers, as they grapple with the unexpected change in their amiable friend. The tale escalates when Aruma observes his fellow misfit classmates being taken advantage of by their surroundings. Fueled by a newfound sense of determination and a desire to stand up for his friends, our protagonist decides to confront the strict and formidable Caligo. Aruma boldly demands a better classroom for his misfit peers, recognizing their potential and yearning for fairness. However, Caligo is quick to dismiss Iruma's plea, asserting that no alternative classrooms are available. Unwilling to accept this answer, our protagonist embarks on an audacious plan that involves securing the illustrious king's royal classroom, a revered space that was once occupied by Durkila, the previous demon king. This classroom holds historical significance, having played a role in the upbringing of the mighty ruler before he ascended the throne. Iruma's audacious proposal leaves Caligo incensed, prompting a clash of wills between teacher and student. Undeterred by Caligo's anger, our protagonist makes a daring wager. If he can secure the unanimous consent of every faculty member within a mere three days, Caligo must yield and grant them the coveted king's classroom. This bold move sets the stage for a high-stakes challenge that promises to test Aruma's ingenuity, determination, and the bonds he shares with his classmates. Intriguingly, as Aruma delves deeper into the dynamics of his fellow misfit classmates, he discovers a surprising truth. Many of them admit that their primary concern isn't necessarily securing the king's classroom. It's the pursuit of what brings them joy and personal gain. This revelation sparks a thought-provoking dialogue on the essence of true demon behavior, prompting our protagonist to articulate an intriguing perspective. Drawing upon his genuine understanding of the demon way of life, Aruma asserts that demons should embrace qualities such as egotism, selfishness, and even a touch of malevolence. It's this very ethos that renders the misfits most deserving of the revered king's classroom. Inspired by Aruma's heartfelt words, his classmates rally together, recognizing the authenticity of his sentiments and the potential of their unity. Later we see that Aruma is ingeniously devising a plan to obtain the diary of their teacher, Caligo. By deliberately riling Caligo up, our protagonist manages to divert his attention, enabling Jazz to deftly pickpocket the coveted diary. Their intentions lie in using the diary as leverage to secure Caligo's consent for their activities. Meanwhile, Clara, the eccentric and vivacious student, enters into a pact with instructor Furcus. She offers Schneider, the misfit's most intelligent student, as an assistant for Furcus' research endeavors in exchange for the coveted consent. The clever Pissero and the mischievous Goman approach instructor Stolas with a proposal to clear the school's weed-infested grounds in return for his consent. Instructor Morax, known for his distinct interests, agrees to grant consent in exchange for Kamui's rather unusual knowledge of production. However, not all negotiations proceed without challenges. Instructor Oreas, a skilled gambler, decides to gamble his consent in a high-stakes game against Lead, a notorious gambler among the Mystics. As the intense game unfolds, Oreas finds himself at odds against Elizabeth's magic, which tilts the odds in Lead's favor. This unexpected twist highlights the power of camaraderie among the Misfits, ultimately leading to Oreas' defeat. The spirited rivalry between Sabnak and Boar takes an unexpected turn when Sabnak approaches Boar with a sincere apology for his past actions. 
Boar, surprised by Sabnok's growth and maturity, eventually agrees to duel with a different outcome in mind. In the climax of the episode, Aruma addresses the student council, including his classmate Amari. With an impassioned speech, he eloquently appeals to Amari's sense of justice and the potential within the misfits. The speech, combined with an unexpected wall slap that leaves Amari in awe, manages to sway her, securing the council's consent. As the days pass, the misfits make remarkable progress in obtaining consents from various instructors, with only Caligo's remaining. What's going to happen? We start with Aruma's bold move to confront Caligo, holding out the collected consent forms from the teachers. However, the Willy Caligo quickly identifies a loophole in the agreement, revealing that Aruma's promise was meant to extend beyond just the teaching staff. The fine distinction between faculty and teachers dawns on our protagonist, highlighting his oversight in not seeking consent from all individuals employed within the school, including janitors, chefs, librarians, and more. Caligo exploits Aruma's lapse in critical thinking, seizing the opportunity to declare him unworthy of inheriting Durkilla's classroom. Aruma faces a moment of uncertainty about his ability to navigate the intricate rules of the demon realm. Just as the atmosphere grows tense, a surprising turn of events unfolds as the remaining staff members make their entrance, brandishing their own consent forms. The staff's collective gratitude for Iruma's past assistance proves to be a pivotal factor, swaying their decision to support him. The dynamic between our protagonist and the staff members deepens, emphasizing the connections he has cultivated throughout his time at the school. In a heated exchange, Caligo's initial resistance crumbles in the face of overwhelming support from the staff and he reluctantly provides his consent. This moment signifies the culmination of the misfits' relentless pursuit and their ability to rally the support of those around them. The anticipation builds as the once-sealed classroom shrouded in mystery for centuries draws a massive crowd eager to witness its unveiling. The Misfits' triumph has transformed them into local celebrities, capturing the attention of students and demons alike. With a ceremonial flourish, Calavo opens the doors to the classroom, unveiling an opulent interior that rivals the grandeur of a castle. The multiple floors, lavish rooms, and extravagant furnishings astound everyone present, showcasing Durkilla's legacy in a breathtaking revelation. Amidst the astonishment, Aruma's audaciousness takes center stage, as he confidently takes his place on Durkilla's old throne. A hushed silence envelops the room. In a stunning twist, our protagonist momentarily embodies the aura of a true demon king, leaving everyone in awe of his transformation. The following day marks a significant turning point as the effects of Alacrid's spell on Aruma come to an end. Aruma's return to his usual self reveals his vulnerability and embarrassment, providing a lighthearted moment that contrasts with the previous grandeur. In a heartfelt gesture, our protagonist extends his apologies to everyone at the school. However, the bonds forged through their shared experiences prove unbreakable. The Misfits' camaraderie shines through as they collectively pose for a photograph, with their room seated on Durkula's throne, capturing a moment of unity and triumph. Now Caligo, the demon teacher, is addressing the Misfits about the impending end of Terminus, which marks the approaching demon summer vacation. However, there's a catch. Should they falter in their exams, they'll be relegated to attending supplementary classes during Terminus, our protagonist finds himself grappling with a new challenge. He confides in Clara and Asmodeus about his struggles with studying. Although Aruma can read the questions thanks to the magical assistance of Sullivan, he struggles to comprehend the essence of the questions themselves. This admission sparks a determined resolve within Asmodeus, who suggests that they form a study group to tackle their academic woes together, the possibility of rank advancement based on exam scores. Meanwhile, the ever-resourceful Ameri, she insists that Elagath join the magical apparatus battler, the reason behind this seemingly peculiar decision is revealed. Keeping tabs on Elagoth has proven to be increasingly time-consuming for the student council. Amidst the chaos, Alacrid shares a heartfelt concern. Alacrid's intellectual prowess is intricately tied to Aruma's rank. If Aruma's rank were to plummet, Alacrid would revert to a mindless black flame demon, demanding a sense of urgency within our protagonist to succeed. With determination burning bright, Asmodeus takes on the role of the tutor, quizzing Aruma on the exam's five subjects. An unforeseen twist in the tale occurs as Aruma remarkably scores a perfect mark on mythical zoology, a subject laden with questions about humans and their society. This unexpected triumph leaves our protagonist infused with newfound confidence, a stark contrast to his earlier struggles. Fueled by this surge in self-assurance, Aruma makes a bold decision. He opts to enroll in an elective class centered around netherworld history, taught by none other than Balam Shichiro the author of the very mythical zoology textbooks that earned Aruma his perfect score. Balam's obsession with enigmatic human-like creatures comes to the forefront. Amidst a discussion about the evolution of demon wings, a perceptive Balam notices a curious detail. Aruma seems to lack the customary wings that adorn the backs of demons. His curiosity peak, Balam astutely observes this absence, prompting him to take a closer look. It's here that an unexpected twist unravels as Alacrid, Aruma's trusty companion, springs into action. 
Alucard assumes the role of miniature wings, attaching himself to Iruma's back. Balam labels Iruma's diminutive wings as a potential deformity. Stricken of concern for exposing Aruma's perceived flaw, Balam's vulnerability emerges as he shares his own abnormality, symbolized by the mask concealing his scarred visage. An inadvertently candid revelation slips from Aruma's lips, shattering the secret he had been guarding. Fearful of Balam's intentions and believing that he might be consumed, our protagonist discloses his true identity as a human. To Aruma's astonishment, Balam's reaction defies his expectations. Rather than harboring sinister intentions, Balam is elated by the proof of human existence. This unexpected reaction serves as a turning point, shattering Aruma's preconceived notions and leading to a realization that Balam's nature is far more benevolent than he had feared. Returning to the realm of the classroom, a wave of despondency washes over the misfits as they grapple with the demands of studying. Aruma's past experiences come to light, revealing a life devoid of leisure during summer breaks as he was burdened with work. The prospect of spending Terminus, the demon's summer vacation, having fun with his newfound companions, the misfits, Balam makes an unexpected reappearance. Revealing that he and Kalago were once classmates, the revelation of their enduring friendship adds depth to their characters. With the misfits struggling to grasp the intricacies of studying, Balam takes on the role of a guiding light. Through ingenious methods such as singing songs, playing games, and crafting educational picture books, Balam ignites a spark of enthusiasm within the misfits, transforming the tedious task of studying into a vibrant and engaging endeavor. The teacher gathers the misfits to unveil the results of their exams. The air is filled with anticipation as he shares the news that all of them have triumphed in their academic endeavors. An aura of accomplishment surrounds them, with several students even ascending to higher ranks. Amidst the celebration, Asmodeus astutely acknowledges Aruma's instrumental role in the misfits' success, attributing their achievements to his profound influence. However, amidst the congratulations and accolades, Aruma's own achievements are met with a bittersweet revelation. While he succeeded in passing his exams, it wasn't quite enough to secure an upward rank movement. A sense of mixed emotions envelops our protagonist as he grapples with his desire for advancement and the satisfaction of having contributed to his friend's triumphs. In the midst of his contemplation, Iruma finds himself engaged in a profound conversation with Balam Shichiro. The eccentric figure recognizes a unique trait within our protagonist, an innate ability to inspire and uplift those around him. Caligo takes center stage once more, revealing a hidden layer of the demon world's hierarchy. Balam emerges as a fellow Ket, rank 8th alongside Caligo himself. Balam's exceptional ability to discern lies proves invaluable, aiding him in detecting exam cheaters, such as the mischievous Elegath. Yet, a tantalizing mystery shrouds one student who remains immune to Balam's truth-detecting prowess. The tale shifts gears, transitioning to a scene filled with humor and camaraderie. A Mary, the diligent student council member, extends an invitation to Iruma for their customary manga reading session. However, Clara, the vivacious and unpredictable member of the Misfits, she informs Amaria that our protagonist is, in fact, occupied with a karaoke session among the boys. In a series of comical events, Amaria finds herself drawn into a girls-only tea party, hosted by none other than Clara, Elisabetta, and Crocell. Within the confines of this tea party, Elisabetta steers the conversation toward relationships, inadvertently unraveling hidden sentiments. Clara's realization of her feelings for Iruma, coupled with her playful consideration of marriage, stirs unexpected ripples. A Mary, typically composed and poised, confronts the realization that Clara might be a genuine rival for Aruma's affection. Amidst friendly banter and fleeting moments of rivalry, the scene culminates in a heartwarming resolution. Disagreements give way to unity as the group agrees to exchange contact information and convene for future tea parties. Finally, Aruma arrives at Mary's doorstep, only to be promptly ushered out. Caligo finds himself thrust into a world of dismay as Sullivan assigns him the arduous task of conducting home visits. His vexation is palpable, and the ensuing escapades promise to be nothing short of chaotic. Caligo's first stop on this whirlwind journey is Asmodeus dwelling. Here, a revelation of profound proportions is unveiled. Asmodeus' unwavering fixation on Aruma has inadvertently led him to neglect his own younger sisters. The gravity of this revelation serves as a catalyst for Caligo's discerning observations. This pivotal insight prompts Caligo to advise Asmodeus to redirect his energies inward, positing the notion that by focusing on self-improvement, he could ascend to new heights and wield a power beyond imagination. Clara's domicile becomes the subsequent destination where chaos takes on an entirely new meaning. Surrounded by Clara's exuberant siblings, Caligo finds himself engulfed in a tempestuous sea of activity. Amidst the clamor, Urara, the embodiment of normalcy within Clara's eccentric family, emerges as a calming presence. This respite enables Caligo to share his insights, painting a portrait of Clara as a spirited troublemaker with an innate goodness and the potential for a radiant future. The Condition – A measured approach to decision-making before taking action. A series of visits ensue, each characterized by its own unique brand of mayhem. 
A thread of absurdity is woven into the fabric of these encounters, a startling revelation surfaces, Kalego's paralyzing fear of opera, who once wielded seniority over him during their high school days. Opera's sadistic amusement at Caligo's expense casts a shadow over their past interactions, and the resulting unease lends an air of tension to their reunion. Armed with insight and information, Caligo apprises Sullivan of Aruma's academic progress and the consistent cycle of major incidents that seem to orbit him. Yet beneath the surface lies a kernel of profound wisdom, Aruma's unique ability to forge indomitable friendships and surmount the most daunting of challenges. The episode crescendos with a touch of playful irony, as Opera's cunning manipulations coerce our protagonist into summoning Caligo in his endearingly adorable owl form. The bonds of friendship remain unwavering. Now, a sense of anticipation fills the air as Terminus, the demon summer vacation, commences. The misfits extend an invitation to Aruma, beckoning him to the Walter Amusement Park. However, things take an unexpected turn when Aruma's guardian Sullivan insists that the strict demons Caligo, Balam, and Opera act as chaperones for the outing. The atmosphere is lighthearted and cheerful as our protagonists, Amery, and their friends arrive at the amusement park, brimming with anticipation for a day of fun. Amery, nursing a secret crush on Aruma, believes this is her chance for a romantic date, but little does she know, the misfits have a different plan in mind. As the group splits into three teams, chaos ensues with each chaperone leading their own faction of the misfits. Caligo, pressured into contributing a prize, attempts to instill a competitive spirit by offering rewards for the most enjoyable team. However, in true Caligo fashion, he ensures that those who rank last will face double the homework as punishment. The girls, displaying their cunning and mischief, come up with a plan to coerce Mary into buying an adorable dress. On the other hand, Caligo's team hatches a plan to make the stern teacher loosen up and genuinely enjoy himself for once. The camaraderie and unique dynamics of each group contribute to the heartwarming essence of the episode. However, the cheerful facade of Walter Park hides a darker secret, one that is unveiled when Aruma encounters Ronov, a demon with ties to the park's ownership. Ronov drops a shocking revelation that the park's basement houses Uroboros Prison, a secretive facility where imprisoned criminals have their magical energy drained to power the park's attractions. The revelation takes a grim twist when it's revealed that Kirio, Aruma's friend, is among the inmates of the prison. It's collaborating with a group of fellow inmates and receiving assistance from the Musashino crew, an extremist organization advocating for the return to evil ways for demons. In his stunning revelation, Kirio's motive becomes clear. He aims to break free from Uroboro's prison and, in return, aid the Musashino crew in their destructive mission to topple Walter Park. With an impending threat to the park's future, our protagonist and his friends find themselves unwittingly entangled in a dangerous scheme. As the misfits embrace the playful spirit of the amusement park, Opera's group embark on a dress-trying spree with Walter Park employees. Caligo's team, led by the stern and often uptight teacher himself, engage in a spirited shooting game with employees Atori and Memero. Competitive spirit ignites as they aim for the highest scores, fostering unexpected connections between the characters and adding an extra layer of excitement to their park adventure. However, the lighthearted atmosphere takes a dramatic turn when Caligo's team contemplates exploring Kiraragi Street, a seemingly innocuous location with a shadowy past. To their surprise, Kalego issues a grave warning about the street's history, a battleground where demons once clashed during their malevolent cycles. Even in the present, the place remains tainted with corruption, attracting criminals and fostering an air of danger. As fate would have it, our protagonist finds himself lost on Kiraragi Street, thrust into an encounter with a dubious demon who attempts to seize him. Miraculously, a woman named Shida intervenes, saving Aruma from harm's way. Despite her serious demeanor, Shida's kindness shines through as she treats Aruma to ice cream and expresses her desire to experience joy. This unexpected meeting sets the stage for a heartwarming sequence, as our protagonist introduces Shida to the pleasures of playing with animals at the petting zoo and embarking on a whimsical Ferris wheel ride. Amidst these moments of connection and discovery, Aruma crosses paths with Asmodeus, leading to an opportunity to express his gratitude to Shida. However, Shida mysteriously disappears, leaving our protagonist bewildered and intrigued. The plot takes an electrifying twist when Aruma learns about Six Fingers, a clandestine criminal group seeking to return to the nefarious ways of old. The ever insightful Rano reveals a new facet of the story by exposing Pissero's hidden beauty when his sleep mask is removed, leaving everyone astonished by his almost otherworldly appearance. In an unexpected revelation, Rano's loyal servant, Wet, departs, unraveling a shocking truth. It's disclosed that the seemingly innocent employees, including Shida, Miki, Huterin, Atori, and Meimaro, are none other than the Six Fingers, a covered alliance plotting to launch an attack on Muruboro's prison in a daring attempt to liberate Kirio. As the episode nears its climax, Wet triggers a series of magical artifacts that summon colossal creatures poised to wreak havoc upon Walter Park. The towering Carmen Dragon, the formidable Mountain Blue Minotaur, and the menacing Panther Rat are summoned forth, setting the stage for a climactic battle. 
that will test the resilience of our characters and the fate of the park itself. Moments later, the worst has happened. The monstrous threats summoned by the Six Fingers initiate the destruction of Walter Park. Amidst the turmoil, Kaleva finds himself at a crucial crossroads. He rallies his team of misfits, urging them to confront the Mountain Blue Minotaur head-on. However, a significant challenge lies ahead. His team members have not yet mastered attack magic, a crucial skill for facing formidable adversaries. Undeterred, Caligo encourages his team to pool their individual talents, leveraging their distinct abilities to create a synergistic attack strategy. In a remarkable display of unity and resourcefulness, the misfits combine their powers, launching a coordinated attack. However, despite their valiant efforts, their assault proves insufficient to quell the fearsome monster's onslaught. Meanwhile, the Six Fingers embark on a daring mission to infiltrate Uruboro's prison, where Kirio is held captive. Among the chaos, the formidable vice chief of the prison, Triton the Handshaker, faces an unexpected challenge as the diminutive Huterin emerges victorious in a shocking showdown. As chaos ensues, Jazz, despite his own trepidation, emerges as a pivotal figure among the misfits. His higher rank compels the others to look to him for guidance, even though he grapples with his own insecurities. Jazz's attempts to devise a successful strategy fall short, leaving him disheartened and overwhelmed by the dire circumstances. In a pivotal moment of revelation, Caligo provides Jazz with a crucial hint linking back to a necklace that Jazz consistently wears. This newfound insight ignites a spark of creativity within Jazz. In a striking contrast to the chaos around him, Aruma grapples with a growing sense of unease and frustration. The once joyful atmosphere of the park's destruction begins to take its toll on him, leading to an unfamiliar sensation, anger. As Aruma witnesses the abandonment of children trapped beneath rubble, he becomes acutely aware of the demon's inherent selfishness, wherein their desire for self-preservation outweighs their compassion for others. This newfound emotion marks a turning point for our protagonist as he grapples with the complexity of his feelings and the growing realization that he is really angry for the first time. Now amidst the chaotic turmoil caused by the rampaging monsters, Iruma's unyielding sense of compassion drives him to spring into action. Unfazed by the colossal Carmen Dragon's menacing presence, he rushes to aid the children trapped amidst the destruction. Iruma's bravery serves as a catalyst, inspiring his fellow classmates to overcome their apprehension and join the fight. Witnessing Aruma's selflessness, the misfits rally to his side, their determination to protect the innocent fuel in their determination. In a breathtaking display of courage, Opera faces off against the fearsome panther rat. As the battle intensifies, each character showcases their unique abilities, infusing the conflict with a sense of individuality and strength. Jazz, along with his male companions, devises a daring plan to distract the Mountain Blue Minotaur. Their coordinated efforts provide Jazz with a chance to execute a bold maneuver, an audacious attempt to infiltrate the Minotaur's ear. As Jazz's necklace is unveiled as the Urpiercer Whistle, a powerful artifact capable of emitting sound waves that amplify with the infusion of magic, the tension escalates. Jazz's ingenious approach culminates in a massive sound wave that ruptures the Minotaur's ears, incapacitating the formidable creature. However, the unexpected intervention of their teacher, Caligo, marks a turning point in the battle. Displaying unparalleled prowess, Caligo dispatches the Minotaur with a single swift move, admitting to the thrill of the fight and even agreeing to commemorate the victory with a celebratory photograph. Meanwhile, Cressel, assuming her Koromu persona, employs her Dem doll show to alleviate panic among the park's visitors, deftly demonstrating her ability to manipulate perception and create moments of respite amid chaos. The narrative takes an intriguing turn as Amere unveils her bloodline ability, Romantista, which enhances her physical capabilities proportionate to her self-belief. Empowered by Krosel's soothing song, Amere emerges victorious against Panther Rat, showcasing her remarkable potential as a formidable force. Opera's profound admiration for Amere's prowess culminates in a surprising offer, employing her to work alongside Sullivan. The alluring prospect of living under the same roof as our protagonist teases Amere. As the chaos continues, Aruma and Pissero's unwavering determination lead them to rescue the trapped children. Simultaneously, Asmodeus and Sabnak brace themselves for an imminent confrontation with the fearsome Carmen Dragon, Wo. The battle between the villains and our dear demons explodes. The Carmen Dragon finds an opening and unleashes its fury upon Balam, our protagonist, and the defenseless children. It's Balam's quick thinking and exceptional prowess that ensures the survival of the group. Yet the escalating danger drives Asmodeus to distraction, fearing for Iruma's safety and inadvertently exposing himself to Dragon's attack, seemingly leading to his demise. Yet Sabnak's revelation dispels the despair, unveiling his selfless act in saving Asmodeus. Sabnak's newfound determination to fight stems from Iruma's own kindness, the very same gesture that rescued him from the clutches of the Valley Guardian. Sabnak's stern reprimand of Asmodeus resonates deeply, highlighting the latter's excessive preoccupation with our protagonist to the detriment of his own aspirations. Their exchange reflects the intricate exploration of friendship, growth, and self-discovery. 
The battle takes an unexpected twist as Balam harnesses his extraordinary abilities to conjure the colossal wooden dragon, Najipner. The awe-inspiring display of power culminates in the defeat of the Karman dragon. The narrative takes an even more exhilarating turn as the Six Fingers sense the defeat of their monstrous creations and merge them into the composite magical beast, a formidable entity poised to escalate the chaos. With their backs against the wall, the remaining characters devise a daring plan to counter the composite magical beast's threat, Opera. Employing his masterful orchestration, encourages our protagonist to summon Caligo in his owl form. Collaborating with Balam and Opera, Caligo joins the fray, infusing the battle with a renewed sense of determination. Amidst the chaos, an imminent disaster looms as the composite magical beast assembles a bomb, endangering the lives of everyone sheltered within the park's emergency refuge. In a breathtaking twist, Ronov intervenes, using his charisma ability to redirect the beast's gaze, diverting the bomb away from the shelter. As Ronov's sacrifice hangs in the balance, Haruma takes a heroic step forward, shielding Ronov in a moment that crystallizes the coolness of our hero. Aruma unveils his not-so-secret weapon, the enigmatic Alacrid. This majestic ring gentleman wields incredible powers and to everyone's astonishment, devours the menacing beast's magic, turning the tides of the battle in Aruma's favor. With a resounding victory, the beast is vanquished once and for all. After the clash, the stern yet secretly proud demon teacher Caligo admonishes our protagonist for his daring actions, expressing his concern for Iruma's well-being. However, amidst the scolding, Caligo acknowledges Iruma's remarkable performance and courage in the face of danger. The admiration from his instructor highlights Iruma's growing reputation as someone truly exceptional. Opera gains insight into why the esteemed demon Sullivan chose Iruma as his grandson. Meanwhile, the plot takes an intriguing turn as Six Fingers, emissaries of the formidable Lord Bull, approach Kirio. Their message reveals Lord Bull's hand in orchestrating their encounter, signaling a more intricate connection between our protagonist and Kirio than initially anticipated. Kirio's emotions surge as he grapples with the revelation that Iruma was responsible for the defeat of the fearsome beast. The concept of destiny intertwining their paths fills Kyria with conflicting emotions, believing that they are destined to be adversaries. The enigmatic Lord Ball himself contacts Kyria, his displeasure evident as he addresses the continued existence of Walter Park. Bill's frustration stems from the park's ability to provide demons with an outlet for stress during their evil cycles, which disrupts his grander plans. Switching gears, the plot takes a lighter turn as Rono's father, grateful for the misfit's role in saving his cherished park, extends his gratitude by offering them accommodation in a luxurious hotel. In a moment that feels straight out of a romantic manga, Amari finds herself alone with Aruma at a party. With sincerity, our protagonist shares his ongoing uncertainty about his ambitions, revealing that for now, he is content with the simple goal of enjoying himself. Amari, displaying vulnerability, approaches Aruma with a heartfelt request, the desire to share a moment together, just the two of them. Amidst the interruption caused by Clara and Asmodeus, our protagonist wholeheartedly agrees, resulting in Amari's sudden and comical collapse. The impact of Eruma's heroics reverberates beyond his immediate circle as news of the battle spreads through the demon world. Overnight, our protagonist becomes a celebrated hero, drawing the attention of reporters and admirers alike. The surge of interest prompts safety concerns, compelling Clara to offer the misfits refuge in her home. Upon their arrival, a playful scene happens as Clara's bustling household greets them with an outpouring of warmth and enthusiasm. Clara's mother and siblings go to great lengths to extend a wholehearted welcome to Aruma, marking this as a momentous occasion in Clara's life, her first friends gracing their home. The environment is teeming with peculiar artifacts, intriguing objects sent back by Clara's father, a seasoned adventurer in his own right. As the narrative progresses, the comical embarrassment surfaces as Clara's baby picture album takes center stage. This vulnerable moment prompts a surprising reaction from our protagonist, who playfully compliments Clara's adorable past self. An enthralling revelation comes to light as the family's primary source of sustenance is unveiled, the neighboring hubbub forest. A discussion ensues, shedding light on Clara and Asmodeus' friendly rivalry in their quest to provide the finest ingredients for Iruma. They embark on a journey to secure the most coveted delicacy, Shabu Shabu from Collateral Cave. A curious amalgamation of animal and plant elements, Clara's admiration for our protagonist as the hero of Walter Park resonates, prompting introspection in Asmodeus regarding his own role in the events at Walter Park. The episode escalates in both excitement and danger as Clara's family confronts the formidable Shabu Shabu. This bizarre beast, a fusion of animal and vegetable characteristics, poses a threat to Clara's brothers, ultimately leading to a dramatic rescue by Asmodeus. The tense encounter showcases the characters' unity and willingness to protect one another, underscoring the significance of their bonds. As Clara unveils her hidden talent, a mesmerizing ability to sing soothing lullabies, this touching moment adds another layer to Clara's character, infusing the episode with a sense of intimacy and connection. The episode concludes with a sentimental revelation as Clara's mother secretly updates the photo album, 
chronicling Clara's growth and progress. Meanwhile, a sense of intrigue looms as Amari's father, Henry, embarks on a journey towards Clara's house and delivers a message to Aruma. He can return home. However, when Aruma asks about Amari, Henry's protective side flares up. Meanwhile, Amari is excitedly planning a special date for her and our protagonist at Aquacase, a cool mix of an aquarium and a swimming pool. Her goal is to create a perfect day filled with memorable moments. However, things don't go as smoothly as she hoped. Amari's taller height makes simple things like holding hands a bit awkward. Even riding the water slide poses challenges as Amari's height means she ends up behind Aruma instead of the other way around. Throughout the day, Aruma's kindness shines through as he buys gifts for everyone, including Clara. This makes Amari a bit jealous, worrying that the date might not be exciting enough. The real twist comes during a fortune-telling show featuring Mako, a water dragon who's supposed to match ideal romantic partners. Unfortunately, the water washes away the perfume masking Iruma's human scent, and chaos ensues. Amari steps in to save our protagonist, and this adventure becomes a metaphor for the ups and downs of relationships. As the day unfolds, Amari's plans seem to crumble, leading to disappointment. But then, Iruma notices a cut on Amari's leg. This moment of vulnerability changes everything. Amari admits she wants to be close to our protagonist and asks him to use magic to make her lighter so he can carry her. This heartfelt gesture shows that true connection goes beyond perfect plans. In the end, Amari realizes that despite the mishaps, their day together was meaningful. Sometime later, Aruma is diligently completing the extra homework assigned by Caligo as a consequence of their loss at the Walter Park competition. Following this, Sullivan and Opera take Aruma shopping, offering him a unique insight into the broader aspects of demon society. Amidst their shopping excursion, Sullivan's curious choice catches Aruma's attention, a book containing prophecies about the Demon King. The intrigue deepens as Sullivan's connection to the Demon King is explored, prompting our protagonist to inquire about the enigmatic figure. Sullivan's reminiscences offer a glimpse into the past as he recounts the tale of Durkilla, the missing Demon King. Strikingly, Durkilla's personality bears a striking resemblance to Aruma's, foreshadowing a potential alignment between their destinies. The narrative evolves as Sullivan delves into the concept of the Thirteen Crowns, the Netherworld's leaders. This elite group holds immense power and influence, mirroring Sullivan's role. Becoming the Demon King necessitates the support of all thirteen, a weighty responsibility due to the Demon King's ability to reshape the netherworld according to their desires. Sullivan's insights provide a profound perspective on the Demon King's role as the embodiment of the netherworld itself, bestowed with absolute authority. The societal structure and norms as they currently exist are reflections of Durkilla's vision for the realm. Sullivan's intriguing revelation paves the way for contemplation regarding Aruma's potential involvement in shaping the future of the netherworld. A sense of foreboding arises as Sullivan casually expresses his curiosity about the outcome should Aruma ascend to the role of Demon King. Aruma's apprehension is palpable, particularly after he reads the Prophecy Scroll. The weight of the Demon King's responsibilities and the potential ramifications of his actions hang heavily over him, ushering in a wave of uncertainty. A surprising turn of events occurs with the appearance of Alacrid, who voices his grievances towards our protagonist. The creature's frustration stems from Aruma's actions during the battle against Beast, which resulted in Alacrid ingesting vast amounts of magic. Alacrid felt largely neglected by Aruma, who has been preoccupied with other matters. As the new term commences, Caligo delivers a crucial piece of information to the Mystics. He informs them that they must all achieve the Dalith rank of fourth rank in order to retain the right to use the royal classroom. And that's the end for season two, guys. Third season, we delve deeper into the misadventures of our dear Aruma Suzuki. The story continues with a significant twist as the no-nonsense teacher Caligo decides to take a unique approach to help the misfit class achieve greatness in the demon realm. He introduces personal tutors for each student, tailored to their individual strengths and weaknesses. First up, Jazz and Alosa are paired with the fiery demon surgeon Furfur. He's promised to make them the craftiest demons around. With Furfur's guidance, the duo embarks on a journey to harness their cunning and devious skills. Next, Gomen and Pesero find themselves under the tutelage of the water demon Vipar. Vipar boasts the ability to train them in unlocking their most potent bloodline abilities. Elizabeth and Clara, on the other hand, are assigned to Raim, a demon tutor specializing in charm and allure. These two young demonists aspire to be the most captivating demons of all, and Raim promises to make their dreams come true. Crocell and Kamui are paired with the enigmatic Mr. Hat. Mr. Hat, a true gentleman, vows to transform them into the greatest summoners of all time. Sabnak and Asmodeus receive guidance from the formidable Balam. Balam's promise is clear, to make them the strongest fighters in Babel's demon school. Meanwhile, Amari Azazel, the school's student council president, can't help but reminisce about her recent date. Although she's disappointed that she didn't get a chance to see him before school started, she understands the importance of their demon studies. Amari's disappointment deepens when Aruma is forced to cancel their reading session of First Love Memories. Due to his lessons with Balls, their assigned tutor, 
Balz, unlike the others, is rather cryptic about his teaching methods and only promises to train their fighting spirits. However, the real twist comes when Balz reveals that their lessons will be conducted by his cousin, Barbatos Bachiko. Barbatos is a stark contrast to Balz. She's loud, violent, and cruel, only teaching them because of a personal request from Sullivan, the school's principal. Barbatos immediately throws them into rigorous training, complete with childish demands and even dressing them in absurd attire for her amusement. In the midst of the tumultuous training at Babel's Demon School, Lee takes a brave step and approaches Balz with a request for personal tutoring. However, Aruma decides to stay with Barbatos, determined to endure her unconventional methods. Barbatos, surprised by Aruma's resilience, reveals that no one else has endured her abuse for such an extended period. She believes that Aruma's stubborn desire to please others makes tutoring him seem pointless, but Aruma is not one to back down from a challenge. He resolves to become the ideal errand boy in Barbatos' eyes, hoping that this will eventually lead to valuable lessons. As the misfit class gathers to discuss their rigorous training experiences, it becomes apparent that each tutor employs unconventional and demanding methods. Gomen and Pissero divulge that Vepper's training includes near-drowning experiences, pushing them to their limits in water-based combat techniques. Meanwhile, all subjects lead to sleep-deprived gaming sessions, aiming to enhance his concentration. Asmodeus and Sabnak are locked in a constant battle with Balam, resulting in numerous injuries as they strive to become formidable warriors. Jazz and Alosar's whereabouts remain a mystery as Furfur whisks them away to an undisclosed location, leaving their fellow classmates curious and concerned. Clara and Elizabetta find themselves striking seductive poses for hours, honing their charm and allure under Raim's guidance. Crocell and Kamui are forced into cages alongside their summoned creatures, testing their abilities and resilience. In the midst of this chaos, Sullivan, the principal of Babel's Demon School, pays a visit to Barbados to inquire about Aruma's progress. To her surprise, Barbados confesses that she forgot to start his actual training. Barbados then reveals her formidable weapon, a bow that can shoot 100 arrows with perfect accuracy. Most demons lack the patience to master such a weapon due to their short attention spans, but she believes Aruma possesses the potential to not only learn but also excel beyond the Dalek level. Seeing Aruma's eagerness to learn, Barbatos decides to take him to the magical apparatus battler, unaware that Aruma has become the de facto president of this establishment after Kirio's departure. Barbatos starts by unveiling her own remarkable bloodline ability, which allows her to craft bows from any material. However, she explains to Aruma that he will need a power core for this spell to work effectively. In a heartfelt moment, Aruma selects a feather from his trusted friend, the Valley Guardian Beast, as the power core for his future bow. Barbatos delivers a stern warning to Aruma, revealing that the next exam, the Harvest Festival, is a brutal battle for survival. She emphasizes that unless he can create a bow tailored to his deepest desires, he is destined to fail. Her concern stems from her past experiences with students who either failed or quit, leaving her with a sense of heartache and doubt. Aruma, seemingly lacking strong desires, presents a unique challenge for Barbatos. As the training intensifies, the Misfit class members face their own trials and challenges. Gomen and Pissero, under Vipar's guidance, evolve their bloodline abilities to break free from Vipar's watery cage. Crocell and Kamu cultivate stronger bonds with their summoned creatures, enhancing their skills as summoners. Lead, on the other hand, begins to outplay Balsa in games, showcasing his improved concentration and mental prowess. Sabnak and Asmodeus learn the value of cooperation as they work together to confront Balam in battle. Elizabeth masters the art of deposing while Clara takes a unique route by mastering sexiness through purity, a rarity in the demon world. Aruma, however, finds himself facing an internal struggle. He grapples with the concept of what his heart truly desires as he attempts to create his personalized demonic bow. Alicrit, his ever-loyal friend, points out that the problem lies in overthinking. Desires, he explains, are instinctive and, above all, selfish. This revelation prompts Aruma to dig deep within himself and confront his most selfish wish to heroically reach the Dalith level. With newfound determination and clarity, Aruma successfully creates a winged demonic bow that astounds Barbados and fills her heart with hope once more. Each member of the Misfit class has now proven their potential for Dalith, and their tutors decide to move them on to the next stage of training, promising more weeks of challenging and relentless trials. Aruma's demonic bow is now ready, though it's equipped with just two arrows, making it crucial for him to choose the right moments for their use. The Harvest Festival arrives with an air of excitement and tension. It's a daunting challenge. Students must venture into a treacherous forest to gather food ingredients. What sets this competition apart is the encouragement of theft and betrayal, as students are graded individually, not as teams. Physical combat is strictly forbidden, but cunning and strategy are rewarded. The winners of the festival are promised great futures, with notable past champions including Amaria Zazel, her father Henry, and the formidable Balam. The weeks of relentless training have left the misfit class battered and bruised, but paradoxically they now exude terrifyingly demonic auras. As the festival commences, Asmodeus eagerly reunites with Aruma, 
While Clara remains concealed within a fluffy animal suit, choosing to remain silent and mysterious. The festival's time limit is set at a daunting 66-66 minutes, which translates to roughly 4.5 days. Ingredients collected can be submitted to referees at any time to earn points. Most students opt for the safer route, gathering easy ingredients worth 10 points each. However, Asmodeus and Sabna have a grander plan in mind. They intend to hunt boss-class monsters, each worth a staggering 3,000 points and share the spoils. Their ambitious strategy is complicated by the introduction of the Dorodoro brothers, Ichiro and Miro. These skilled warriors, despite their prowess, have been forced to repeat their first year for their notorious rule-breaking tendencies. The Dorodoro brothers propose a competition for the boss monsters, setting the stage for a thrilling showdown amidst the dense and perilous forest. And let's not forget the ultimate prize, the legendary legend Leaf, worth an astonishing 100,000 points. The Dorodoro brothers have set their sights on retrieving their master, whom Sabnak and Asmodeus allegedly stole from them. Krosel and Kamui, armed with their enhanced summoning abilities, ingeniously delegate the task of gathering ingredients to the monsters they summoned. This clever strategy allows them to accumulate points while minimizing the physical effort required. Aloser, known for his sharp intellect, joins forces with Jazz to orchestrate a cunning plan. They identify the most valuable ingredients and employ their wits to con other unsuspecting students out of their hard-earned points. However, a shocking revelation from their past training comes to light. It is disclosed that Furfur, their demon tutor, had actually run up a massive debt to the fearsome demon mafia. In desperation, Furfur sold Jazz and Aloser to settle his debt, leading them to work in a casino under the mafia's watchful eye. In this high-stakes environment, they honed their skills at anticipating people's intentions and manipulating them. The daily ritual of Furfur challenging them to a coin toss for their freedom became their torment. Jazz, convinced that Furfur was cheating but unable to discern how, faced repeated defeat. After enduring this ordeal for three weeks, Jazz and Aliser had an epiphany. They realized that the key to victory wasn't uncovering Furfur's cheating methods, but rather beating him in his own game. They resorted to a dirty trick to secure a win in the next coin toss. However, Furfur, in a surprising twist, had anticipated their cheating and somehow still emerged victorious. Yet, he offered them a chance at redemption, proposing a rematch in the form of a game during the Harvest Festival. Meanwhile, Sullivan, our beloved school's principal, watches the unfolding events with a hint of concern. Many students are plotting to ambush Iruma, and yet, Iruma seems remarkably composed, calmly waiting for their attempts. Balam, ever the insightful commentator, steps in to shed light on Iruma's unconventional strategy. The festival spans four days and most demons exhaust themselves by frantically exchanging ingredients for points in the early stages. They often succumb to hunger and fatigue, ultimately losing their chances of victory. In contrast, Aruma's decision to eat first and gather points later may prove to be a winning strategy. As a survival expert due to his harsh upbringing, Aruma understands the importance of conserving energy and making calculated moves. Taking on the role of a mentor, Aruma begins to teach Lee the art of thriving in adversity. Their camaraderie and newfound knowledge foster an unexpected bond, and Lee starts to genuinely enjoy himself during the festival. However, he laments the lack of female company to talk to, fondly reminiscing about the mixer they attended with Sabnock, Jazz, and girls from other classes. As if summoned by the conversation, Elisabetta and Clara make an abrupt entrance. Clara's exuberance sweeps Aruma away, and Elisabetta skillfully charms Lead, gaining access to his secret ingredient stash without resorting to her newly acquired powers. During Elisabetta's training, it is revealed that she had wished for the skills to find true love, a testament to her desire for genuine affection. Left alone with Clara, Aruma is in for a surprise as she unexpectedly pulls him inside her costume, trapping them both within. Clara declares Aruma successfully captured. Clara, our dear demon, reveals to Aruma that her magical pockets have evolved into a mesmerizing dimensional space known as the Toy Box. This extraordinary space is brimming with an endless array of toys and games, igniting Aruma's childlike excitement. Caught up in the allure of the Toy Box, Aruma and Clara lose track of time and play games for hours on end. However, Clara has more than just fun and games on her mind. In a private moment, she confides in Aruma, confessing her hidden agenda to make him fall head over heels in love with her. Little do they know, the toy box has a hidden purpose. It drains the magic of those who enter to sustain its enchanting wonders. As the hours pass, Clara is surprised to discover that her magical energy is depleting at a faster rate than Aruma's, leading her to a startling realization. She might already be in love with Aruma. With her heart pounding, Clara musters the courage to confess her feelings to Aruma, but their intimate moment is abruptly interrupted by the unexpected arrival of Elisabetta, realizing that night has already fallen. Iruma wonders what might have transpired had Elisabetta not intervened. Clara and Elisabetta make their exit, their mission to steal ingredients for the school competition a success. Exhausted students, overwhelmed by the challenges of the competition, become victims of the treacherous ingredients they must confront. 
Panic spreads as students struggle to cope with the various magical abilities of these ingredients, leaving many incapacitated and in need of assistance from the vigilant referees. In a particularly humorous turn of events, a monstrous ingredient gives chase to a group of girls who seek refuge within a castle. To their astonishment, they awaken Pissero, who had been peacefully slumbering inside. However, Pissero's typically concealed face is now fully exposed, revealing his astonishingly handsome features. The girls are instantly smitten, falling head over heels in love with him. Later, we observe the escalating tensions between Pissero and Goman. Pissero, known for his unique ability called My Area, reveals that he has extended his bed into an entire castle, a personal sanctuary that he fiercely guards. However, his temper flares as he discovers Goman's apparent disregard for his privacy, allowing people to enter his sacred space. The situation takes a serious turn as more students attempt to enter the castle, pushing Pissero to the brink of a confrontation with Goman. The girls caught in the middle of this impending shoveldown can only watch nervously as the tension escalates. Despite the brewing hostility, Goman ultimately decides to rescue the students, setting aside his differences with Pissero. However, Pissero, driven by guilt and his pride, can't resist reigniting the argument when he notices Goman has saved dozens of people. Meanwhile, in a different part of the demon school, the tutors, including Sullivan, Opera, and Barbados, gather for a drinking party. Amidst the revelry, Mr. Hat proudly announces the impressive achievements of some students. Crocell and Kamui have earned a staggering 14,200 points. Rain boasts about Elizabetta and Clara's manipulation skills, which have garnered them 9,400 points by playing with the hearts of the boys. Vipar commands Pissero and Goman, who have earned 8,200 points by utilizing their castle's safety for hunting. Furfur celebrates Jazz and Aloser, who have cunningly accumulated 12,800 points through theft and strategy. Amidst the discussions and celebrations, Sullivan and Barbatos assert that Iruma is the dark horse of the competition, despite the fact that he and Lead currently have zero points. Their faith in Iruma's potential sparks curiosity and excitement among the tutors as they contemplate his hidden abilities. As the night deepens, the effects of the drinking party take their toll, and the tutors eventually pass out, their revelry coming to a comical conclusion. In a forest, the students settle down for the night, seeking rest and respite. However, a few demons remain vigilant, as Modius, Sabnak, and the Dorodoro brothers find themselves locked in a fierce battle against a colossal monster known as the Flapple Bird, worth a hopping 10,800 points. The Dorodoro brothers prove to be a formidable team. Nero, with his strategic prowess, complements Ichiro's exceptional combat skills perfectly. In contrast, Asmodeus and Sabnak find themselves constantly at odds, their incessant arguments hindering your coordination. However, the Dorodoro brothers hold the secret weapon up their sleeves, a bloodline ability known as the Peacock of Provocation. This ability has the uncanny power to provoke their enemies into losing their temper, a formidable tactic that they employ to goad Sabmak into attacking them. Their goal? To disqualify him from the festival. As Sabmak's fury escalates, Asmodeus manages to stop him just in the nick of time, inadvertently exposing the brothers' unique ability. As the tension subsides, Nero and Ichiro share the story of their past. They once aspired to become mighty warriors, but their dreams nearly cost them their lives when they entered a battle woefully unprepared. Fortunately, they were rescued and trained by a mysterious master who suddenly left to become a teacher at Babel's. Asmodeus and Sabnak assume this master to be Balam. However, it's revealed that their master is none other than Furfur. They had never bothered to confirm Furfur's identity, assuming he would tutor the strongest of the misfits. Amidst the chaos, Asmodeus discloses a disturbing secret. Balam had given the secret pills that could trigger his evil cycle at will, unleashing his repressed evil side. This transformation turns Asmodeus into an unimaginably elegant yet savage force to be reckoned with, and the formidable creature is defeated. Despite their desire to see Asmodeus disqualified, the Dorodora brothers must now dodge his relentless attacks to avoid meeting a grim fate. Thankfully, Sabnak manages to snap Asmodeus back to his normal self using a programmed password, the closest thing to Asmodeus' heart, Aruma. Once restored to his usual self, Asmodeus and Sabnak engage in a playful argument over who should claim the lion's share of points earned from their victory against the Flapple Bird. The Dorodora brothers, unable to believe they were defeated by a pair with such poor teamwork, are left astounded by the outcome of their battle against Asmodeus and Sabmak. Later, we can see that the campus is buzzing with anticipation due to the festival. Lead is convinced that Iruma has a grand plan in store for the day, to find the elusive legend Leaf. Iruma is taken aback by the suggestion but goes along with it without much thought. The legend Leaf, a mysterious and highly sought-after treasure, has never been seen by any student before. Iruma ponders the possibility of seeking answers from the creatures of the forest, leading them to the enigmatic duo of Crocell and Kumbui. However, they soon discover that Crocell is on the brink of her evil cycle, thanks to her newfound authority over animals. In her altered state, she styles herself as the Queen of Monsters, with Kamui as her loyal majordomo. 
In a peculiar arrangement, Krosil and Kamui agree to share their knowledge in exchange for Iruma, dressed in elegant attire, dancing and posing for photographs while Karoli captures the moments. With this peculiar agreement, the monsters reveal an astonishing revelation. The legend leaf has not yet sprouted, and they offer a riddle regarding the location of the seed and the vase required for its growth. This riddle leaves Aruma in deep contemplation. Watching from the sidelines, the tutors are genuinely impressed. For the first time, a student has managed to unearth the riddle associated with the legend leaf, a feat that garners admiration and curiosity from the instructors. As the festival progresses, exhaustion takes its toll on numerous students, leading to a wave of withdrawals. To address this, the referees enlist the assistance of the student council to help rescue those in need. Amari firmly believes that Iruma will be the one to finally unlock the secrets of the legend leaf. In a playful exchange, one of the council members teases Amari, suggesting that Iruma might one day present her with the flowers of the legend leaf in a romantic bouquet. Amari's curiosity leads her to an unexpected discovery, a clandestine gambling den where forfeited students wager on the festival's outcome. To her astonishment, the ringleaders of this underground operation turn out to be none other than two misfits, Jazz and Aloser. They disclose that they had fallen victim to a cunning student named Arobas, who possesses a bloodline ability known as Trauma. This ability plunged Jazz into nightmarish visions, tormenting him with disturbing images of his selfish brother, Rock. In his delusion, Jazz attacked what he believed to be Rock, only to discover that he had unknowingly assaulted Arobas. This unfortunate turn of events led to the disqualification of both Jazz and Aloser. As Amiri listens intently, Aloser reveals a troubling pattern. Orobus has been specifically targeting misfits to disqualify them from the festival. This revelation sends shockwaves through the student council, raising concerns about the safety of their peers. Determined to uncover the secrets of the legend Leaf, Iruma and Lee decide to tackle the riddle head-on, each taking half of the puzzle and embarking on separate quests. However, Iruma's solo journey leads him to a cave, a place where the seed of the legend Leaf should reside. This discovery prompts concern from Alucard, who worries about Iruma's ability to defend himself alone in such treacherous terrain. Inside the cave, Aruma stumbles upon a fellow student named Nafula the Silent, a notorious figure known for his off-putting odor. Alucard suggests leaving Nafula behind, but Aruma's compassionate nature prevails and he chooses to rescue him from the entangling vines that ensnare him. Their journey takes an unexpected turn as they reach an underground temple, the potential resting place of the legend Leaf Seed. However, their pursuit is interrupted by the appearance of the Seed's formidable guardian, Toto the Jenny. Narrowly avoiding an attack by Toto, Iruma, and Nafula, find themselves in a precarious situation. Tona presents them with a choice. To obtain the seed, they must either defeat him in battle or provide something of interest. However, Toto is known to possess vast knowledge about the netherworld. Iruma realizes that Toto is entirely ignorant about humans. In a clever bid to win Toto's favor, Iruma, Alucard, and Nafula decide to enact scenes from first love memories, captivating Toto's curiosity and obsession with their storytelling. Impressed and thoroughly entertained, Toto rewards them with the coveted seed. However, he demands a unique exchange, Iruma's phone number ensuring they can continue sharing captivating tales in the future. Sometime later, Iruma, who has been steadily amassing points, decides to share his hard-earned points with Nafula, a fellow student. What's even more intriguing is that Iruma realizes something extraordinary. Nafula's foul stench no longer bothers him. However, as Iruma and Nafula navigate their way out of Toto's temple, they encounter an unexpected and menacing obstacle. Iruma's human parents, the very people who abandoned him in the demon world, resurface in his life. It becomes chillingly clear that they have returned not out of love or concern for their son, but to exploit him once more. The fear and dread that wash over Iruma at the sight of his selfish parents are palpable, and it's a moment that hits home for anyone who has ever faced a toxic family dynamic. The tension escalates as Iruma, overwhelmed by terror, slips and plummets into a foreboding chasm. Orobas, a cunning and malevolent character, uses his dark magic to subject Aruma to these horrific illusions. In these visions, Aruma is confronted with the horrifying prospect of his friends rejecting him for being human and his beloved guardian, Sullivan, attempting to send him back to his neglectful human parents. Despite his rational knowledge that these visions are fabricated, Aruma is paralyzed by the genuine fear of losing the people who have come to accept him for who he is. It's a raw and emotionally charged moment that delves deep into Aruma's insecurities and the lingering trauma of his human life. Just when it seems like Aruma is on the brink of despair, a glimmer of hope emerges. A vision of Barbatos, one of his formidable mentors, appears before him. This moment serves as a powerful reminder of the life-threatening challenges Aruma has conquered during his time at Babel's Demon School. It rekindles his courage and determination, propelling him to take decisive action. Summoning his trusty bow, Aruma uses one of his precious two shots to obliterate the nightmarish visions that have tormented him. It's a symbolic act of overcoming his inner demons and facing his fears head-on. With renewed determination burning in his eyes, Aruma makes a resolute decision. 
He will become the best demon he can be and prove himself to everyone, especially himself. His goal is to win the upcoming festival. Alk, it's now the festival's third day and the stakes are raised to a whole new level. Kaleido drops a bombshell that sends shockwaves through the entire demon school. He reveals that the winner of the festival will earn the prestigious title of Young King, positioning them as a potential successor to the Demon King himself. This revelation adds an intense layer of competition and ambition to an already heated event. However, as the tension builds, he announces that there's still one student with a staggering zero points. The realization hits them like a tidal wave, it must be Aruma. The misfits, who have come to see Aruma as their beacon of hope and inspiration, are momentarily crushed by this revelation. It's a testament to the strong bonds that have formed among these outcast students. Despite the grim situation, Asmodeus and Clara refuse to give up on Aruma. But Aruma's predicament takes a physical toll on him. His injured leg prevents him from climbing the chasm walls and rejoining the festival. Just when it seems like all hope is lost, an unexpected savior emerges, Nafula. With a swift display of his powers, Nafula conjures a fast-growing vine that sprouts into a ladder, providing Iruma with a means to escape the chasm. Yet even with this lifeline, Iruma's injured leg proves to be a significant hindrance. In this dire moment, Iruma's resourcefulness shines through as he recalls a remarkable ability linked to his human blood. He remembers how his blood healed the Valley Guardian's baby, and he decides to put this newfound knowledge to the test. Adding a single drop of his blood to the vine, something astonishing occurs. The vine responds explosively, growing at an astounding rate and breaking through the ground to tower over the entire forest. This breathtaking display of power leaves both students and teachers in awe and disbelief. It's a pivotal moment that showcases Iruma's potential and the extraordinary abilities he possesses despite being a mere human in a demon world. Determined to prove himself, Aruma boldly declares his intention to win the festival despite Caligo's stern reminder that he still has zero points. Meanwhile, in the midst of this festival chaos, another subplot unfolds. Leave, a student who has shown a penchant for mischief and clever strategy, successfully retrieves the coveted vase of endings. He achieves this feat by defeating his own Ginny in a grueling series of 100 difficult games. The stakes are high as the referees announce that the vase alone is worth a staggering 20,000 points, making Lead a tempting target for other ambitious students. Lead attempts to navigate the festival grounds while keeping the vase hidden, but he once again crosses paths with the seductive and mysterious Elisabetta. Sometime later, we observe Aruma stumbling upon Lead, who is visibly distressed. Lead's revelation is shocking. Elisabetta is the center of the predicament. However, it's not what you might expect. She didn't use her seductive charms to rob Lead of something valuable. Rather, she delivered a stunning blow by bluntly stating that he is not her type and that she doesn't like him. This unexpected rejection hits Lead like a ton of bricks, causing him to faint from the sheer shock of it all. Iruma, ever the observant and caring friend, knows that Elisabetta wouldn't typically be so needlessly cruel and that it might be connected to Arobas, a mischievous demon known for his cunning tricks. As the pieces of the puzzle start falling into place, Lee reveals an extraordinary ability, his sense steel. With this enhanced power, he delves deep into the situation and uncovers the truth. The real Elisabetta is miles away, enjoying a secret hot spring excursion with her friends Clara and Crossell. The plot thickens as Crossell expresses her desire to form a team with Elisabetta and Clara. Crossell's ulterior motive becomes evident. She plans to invade Pissero and Goman's castle, steal their precious ingredients stockpile, and claim the coveted title of Young King for herself. Pisero, a peaceful demon with no interest in engaging in combat, decides to take the path of surrender to Crossel's advances. However, the situation takes an unexpected turn when the students sheltering in the castle make a collective decision to fight back against Crossel's ambitions. Kamui takes the lead in organizing the defense. He has been trained in the art of gentleman combat, which combines elegance and power in battle. Despite their valiant efforts, Kamui and his fellow monsters are met with a formidable challenge, Gomen's enhanced wind sword technique. This powerful technique proves to be more than a match for their collective strength. Faced with this adversity, Kamui calls upon boss-class monsters as reinforcements, escalating the battle to new heights. The battlefield becomes a chaotic arena where alliances are tested, ambitions clash, and friendships are put to the test. Meanwhile, not far from the chaos, Iruma Lead and Nafulo watch the unfolding events in a state of bewildered terror. Now we switch the focus to Arobas. This cunning and competitive demon decides to trade the stolen vase for a staggering 20,000 points. This astute maneuver catapults him into the lead among the students. Back at the castle, the defending students valiantly repel the invading monsters, but the situation takes an ominous turn. Elisabetta, with her enchanting charm, begins to employ her mesmerizing abilities to captivate the male students, effectively taking them captive. Intriguingly, Clara, one of Iruma's close friends, disappears from the scene. Iruma, Lead, and Nafula join forces with Elisabetta, their suspicions mounting as they seek to uncover the truth behind Arobas' actions. Together, they confirm that Arobas has set his sights on the Mystics. 
Meanwhile, Orobas, who has consistently occupied the second place position and is rumored to be affiliated with a cult that worships the second, harbors an unbearable jealousy towards the Mystics. He is driven by a burning desire to surpass them in popularity and abilities, with his ultimate goal being to become the young king. However, a brief moment of guilt washes over Orobas as he reflects on the trauma he has inflicted on the Misfits. His partner, Ocho, cunningly manipulates his emotions, leaving him to forget his guilt and fueling his determination to break the minds of Iruma and his friends with the most potent level of trauma. The stakes couldn't be higher as Orobas prepares to use his darkest powers to ensure their suffering lasts a lifetime. Just when it seems like all hope is lost, an unexpected savior emerges from the shadows. Asmodeus appears seemingly out of nowhere to confront Orobas and put a stop to his nefarious plans. Despite being disqualified for his attack on Orobas, Asmodeus proceeds to knock him out anyway. He sternly warns Orobas that he will return and kill him if he dares to harm Aruma or any other member of the Misfits again. What a display of unwavering loyalty to Aruma and his friends. Asmodeus, with his extravagant flair, offers to host a party at his house, promising a celebration to remember. However, the devious plot thickens as Ocho, Orobas' cunning partner, secretly retrieves Orobas. With confidence that Orobas has already submitted the vase, which seemingly secures his path to becoming the young king, Ocho sweetens the deal by offering him extra rare plants. Orobas, fueled by ambition and greed, eagerly accepts this offer, unaware of the storm that is about to descend upon him. But just when it seems that Orobas is on the cusp of victory, Aruma refuses to surrender. He is steadfast in his belief that there must be a way to turn the tide in their favor. In a surprising twist, the referee Orobas had submitted the vase to reappears, revealing himself to be Alasur in disguise. Alasur, a clever strategist, explains that while Jazz was disqualified for attacking Orobas, he himself never attacked anyone. Instead, he posed as disqualified to gain access to the cameras that were monitoring the competition, all while remaining a legitimate competitor. With the help of the disqualified, they devise a cunning plan for revenge and successfully stole the vase, thwarting Orobas' ambitions of victory. Alosa returns the vase to Aruma, placing the trust of all the misfits squarely in his hands. As the competition draws to a close, a sense of pride swells among the remaining misfits. They have defied the odds and achieved high scores, a testament to their resilience and determination. With the vase and the precious seed in their possession, Iruma and Leeds stand ready to grow the elusive legend leaf. Nafula, armed with his trusty watering can, takes on the crucial task of nurturing the legend leaf. However, it quickly becomes apparent that this endeavor requires not only water, but also a vast amount of magic to coax the leaf into its full bloom. Iruma, ever resourceful, contemplates using his Ifrit mode to infuse the leaf with the required magic. However, his magical energy is too depleted from the events that transpired earlier. Just when all seems lost, Clara, the ever unpredictable friend, steps up in a moment of selflessness. She generously contributes the magic she accumulated from her toy box. However, just as the leaf blossoms, Aruma experiences a startling vision of the demon king Durkilla, a moment that hints at deeper mysteries yet to be unraveled. As if to add a touch of whimsy to the proceedings, the leaf finally blooms, revealing an anticlimactic, goofy face. This unexpected outcome coincides perfectly with the conclusion of the Demon School Festival. In an act of true friendship and solidarity, Clara and Nafula choose to forego their share of the points earned, ensuring that Iruma and Lead each receive 50,000 points. This generous gesture reflects the unbreakable bonds they forged throughout their journey. But there's one last twist in store for everyone. Orobes, who had appeared to be the victor with 58,000 points, remains unsatisfied. However, Jazz, ever the astute observer, points out a critical detail that alters the outcome. The Legend Leaf is worth a staggering 100,000 points and the vase is valued separately at 20,000 points. The judges confirm this revelation, shuffling the rankings and revealing that Iruma and Lead are the joint victors with 60,000 points each. This surprising turn of events produces Orobas to a respectable third place. Unexpectedly, Orobas finds contentment in this outcome as it finally breaks his curse of always coming in second place. Furthermore, this turn of events helps him confront the deeper issues within himself. He recognizes that his initial hostility toward the misfits was rooted in jealousy over their genuine friendships. With heartfelt remorse, he offers a sincere apology to the misfits and is forgiven by the entire school community. As the dust settles and the truth behind the legend leaf is unveiled, Amari reveals that Nafula is a student council member and saving him from the vines was the secret third task necessary for the leaf to bloom. Only Nafula held the rainbow watering can required for this momentous occasion. The legend leaf, now fully in bloom and with the ability to speak, reveals that the tasks set before the competitors were actually tests of character. They were designed to identify the least evil demon worthy of becoming the young king, emphasizing the importance of empathy and goodness in leadership. To honor the young king and celebrate the harmonious resolution, the leaf announces a prize for every demon in attendance. 
A breathtaking scene shows us that leaf explodes in a burst of fiery brilliance. As the leaf disintegrates, it transforms the surrounding forest into a breathtaking sea of cherry blossoms, a permanent monument to honor the young kings. Iruma and Lead receive a significant promotion ascending to the coveted Dalit rank of fourth rank in the demon hierarchy. This promotion is a testament to their dedication, hard work, and remarkable achievements during their time at Babel's. Meanwhile, other notable folks such as Arobus, Sabnak, and the Dorodoro brothers also achieve a noteworthy promotion, reaching the prestigious Gimel rank. Pissero and Goman, who have been guarding students in their castle, are also promoted to the Gimel rank, further celebrating their dedication to protecting their fellow students. Crocell and Kamui, on the other hand, attain Gimel rank through their remarkable ability to tame and control monsters. Elisabetta, our powerful demoness, makes her mark by achieving the Bet rank, which is the second rank in the demon hierarchy. Amidst the celebrations, Barbatos commends Iruma for his remarkable success, further solidifying his reputation as an exceptional student. Following the formal proceedings, an extravagant afterparty ensues. It's a time for camaraderie and revelry, where the Dorodoro brothers stumble upon a surprising revelation. They learn that Sabnak and Asmodi as a master is not Furfur as they previously believed. Iruma, in particular, seizes the opportunity to connect with his friends and grabs Clara and Asmodeus, refusing to let go. As the celebrations continue, Crocell grapples with the guilt and embarrassment stemming from her actions as the Monster Queen. Caligo harbors concerns about Aroba's amnesia and who might have manipulated him. His worries are momentarily set aside when he is summoned by Aruma, now in his adorable fluffy owl form. Towards the conclusion of this eventful episode, the guys return home to their respective parents. Babel's teachers decide to unwind and celebrate their students' achievements by going out for drinks. Even Caligo, who is typically reluctant to participate in such social events, is coerced into joining by Balam, adding a touch of humor to the gathering. As the teachers enjoy their time together, Robin, the host of the party, decides to play a matchmaking role by seating Momonoki next to Caligo. It becomes apparent that Momonoki has a long-standing crush on Caligo, dating back to when he mentored her as a trainee. During the course of their conversation, the teachers unanimously agree that Aruma is undeniably the most impressive student at Babel's. Robin shares his belief that students are like family. He believes that the bonds between teachers and students are akin to familial relationships. This sentiment is met with chilling disagreement from the other teachers, who emphasize a different perspective. Students are not family but rather treasures that teachers must protect at all costs. The implication of what happens to those who threaten these treasures referred to as discipline. The story takes a dramatic turn with a flashback to the end of the festival. It is revealed that Ocho, who was previously introduced as Aroba's partner, was actually an infiltrator from the Second Faith, a secretive cult that worships the number two. Ocho manipulated Aroba's into believing that his perpetual curse of always coming in second place was an omen. Intriguingly, Robin, acting on Caligo's orders, locates and shoots Ocho, though the wound is non-fatal. This act serves as a warning to the cult, suggesting that the teachers are willing to take drastic measures to protect their students. Ocho, now wounded and fearing for his life, reports to his master, Ball, about all the valuable information he has gathered about the misfit class, including a shocking revelation. Aruma is a human. This revelation shakes the foundation of the demon world, especially for Kiriwo, who has become Bull's subordinate. Kiriwo salivates with joy at the prospect of plunging Aruma into ultimate despair by consuming him. Bale, the mastermind behind the second faith, confirms that the demon world is about to become considerably more interesting and unpredictable due to these newfound revelations and the potential chaos they could bring. Meanwhile, as the night progresses, Caligo and Balam leave the responsibility of getting the inebriated teachers home safely to the unfortunate Robin. The plot changes to Iruma paying a visit to Leeds' home, eager to spend some quality time together playing video games. However, the tranquility of their gaming session is disrupted when Lead playfully reveals an erotic magazine attempting to coax Aruma into discussing his romantic interests. This unexpected turn of events causes a commotion, accidentally awakening Lead's terminally unmarried sister, Shaki. Shaki, upon seeing Aruma, attempts to charm him with her presence, but Lead intervenes and promptly sends her to her room. This scene provides a humorous glimpse into the dynamics of Lead's family. Surprisingly, Shaki is secretly impressed by Leed's newfound sense of responsibility and his growing affection for his friends. This heartwarming moment highlights Leed's character development and underscores the importance of friendship in the demon world. Back in Aruma's world, he resumes reading First Love Memories with Amari, starting with a chapter focused on cooking. Amari, in a bid to express her congratulations for Iruma's victory in the Harvest Festival, decides to make him sweets. Iruma's response takes her by surprise as he invites her to his house to cook together. However, the situation quickly takes a comical turn when it becomes evident that both Aruma and Amari are utterly inept in the kitchen. Their attempts at cooking are so disastrous that Opera, their trusty demon butler, steps in to prevent them from accidentally poisoning themselves. 
What follows is a harrowing ordeal in the kitchen that leaves poor Opera mentally scarred. Despite the chaos, they manage to bake simple cookies. Iruma plans to share his cookies with his friends, but he's taken aback when Amari offers hers to him as a gesture of congratulations for his Harvest Festival victory. This touching moment deepens the connection between Aruma and Amari. However, Opera, understandably concerned for their safety, staunchly refuses to allow them to try their hands at cooking more complicated meals, hinting at potential culinary disasters to come. In the last episode of the third season we watch as Sullivan invites the esteemed Barbados over for snacks. However, this casual gathering takes a dramatic turn when Sullivan confides in Barbatos about the recent kidnappings of high-ranking demons by the notorious Musashino gang. He entrusts Barbatos with a crucial task, to continue tutoring Aruma. The bombshell revelation doesn't stop there. Sullivan decides to confide in Barbatos about Aruma's true identity. He's a human. Barbatos is left in utter shock by this revelation, and Sullivan offers to erase her memory to protect the secret. However, Barbatos makes a surprising choice and decides to keep the knowledge of Eruma's humanity to herself, setting the stage for her own internal conflict and loyalty to her friend. Meanwhile, Asmodeus extends an invitation to Eruma and Clara to visit his home. As expected, Clara brings her usual brand of chaotic energy to the gathering. However, the tone shifts when Asmodeus proudly boasts about Clara's status as a Gaimel, the third rank in the demon hierarchy. Clara takes the opportunity to gloat about the time she played with Aruma in her toy box, adding a playful twist to the conversation. Amidst the fun and banter, Aruma grapples with intense guilt for still not having revealed his true identity as a human to his friends. This internal conflict reaches a breaking point when Asmodeus' mother, Amu, overhears Aruma's guilt-ridden musings about keeping secrets. She offers him sage advice, assuring him that keeping secrets is not inherently bad, as long as he feels he can be a genuine friend without revealing the truth. Aruma takes this advice to heart and decides to open up to his friends about the depth of his feelings and gratitude toward them. He expresses how much their friendship means to him, particularly the invaluable support they provided during the Harvest Festival. Privately, he harbors the hope of one day revealing the truth to them. After the credits, we are back at school, the Mystic class prepares for the upcoming music festival, a critical opportunity to secure promotions for their classmates. However, an unexpected twist emerges when their stern teacher, Caligo, reminds them of another classmate who has been overlooked all this time, who remains at the bet rank completely unnoticed by everyone. Who is that guy? And that's all for now, see you soon guys and gals.